the truth of it. Because the only ones who have benefited from that brutal assassination has been our enemy. That it has kept us apart. And we in the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee feel that it is our responsibility to do all we can to bring to you all of the information, the scholars, the learned people who have analyzed, who have researched this matter, have written books on it, so that hopefully we will generate enough interest and enough concern that there will be a ground swell from among our people to let us get to the root of this, let us find the answer. In finding the answer, last year, we put on a forum titled, How Was Malcolm Killed? This year, the title is, Why Was Malcolm Killed? Be aware of the fact, however, that you cannot separate the two questions. So although we've moved on from how Malcolm was killed from last year, that still would be very germane and important here tonight. How was Malcolm killed and why was Malcolm killed? And we hope that coming out of that groundswell of, of, of desire on your part for an answer to be given, that we will be able to demand that some form of tribunal be set up to do an unbiased and to do a, an objective hearing or to conduct and an unbiased and, con and uh, an unbiased hearing. We're not asking that the United States government do this. That would be like asking the fox to defend the wolf against the hens. And when we know that they both are interested in breaking into the hen house, we want that hearing, if we can bring that about, to take place in the black community so that we can resolve the differences and the problems that are facing us and confronting us because of the death of Brother Malcolm. And we can move forward with our liberation struggle. Thank you. Now tonight we want to have our speakers present their messages to you briefly. We want to give you an opportunity to ask questions from the floor. And so when you do, when we do open the floor for questions, we hope that your question will be brief and to the point and directed to specific people here on the platform. Now having said that, I'd like to move on and introduce our moderator for the evening, who really, as they always say, the cliche, he really needs no introduction. And he doesn't. Samori Marksman, who is the program director for WBAI, will be our moderator for the evening. And I'll turn over the microphone to him at this point. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Herman Ferguson. Um, let me first uh, thank all of you in the audience for allowing us to come before you this evening. And we are grateful that despite the distractions in this town, particularly on a holiday weekend, that you were able to set time aside to come here to listen to us and discuss what is indeed an extremely important issue for all of us. As Brother Herman said, we are here today to mark, if we are to be honest, we are here to mark death, is essentially why we are here. The 30th anniversary of the death of El Haj Malik Shabazz of Malcolm X, Malcolm Biddle of Brother Omar Wale. And very often we come here, we've had, needless to say, too many of these programs in the past, and many of us have been a bit upset at having to come together around uh, issues like this, or on occasions like these. Because it seems to us that too often, our leaders, those who are most important to us, not only nationally but internationally, are removed from us in, uh, in a, at a very early point in their lives. So we're here for two basic reasons. One, of course, to mark the death, the passing of El Haj Malik Shabazz Malcolm X, and also to, as the brother said, to unravel the conspiracies, to try to understand what happened, 
so that maybe we could clean the wounds and heal them and maybe move forward. And hopefully today our speakers will begin to begin that process if it hasn't already begun. One of the things that uh, bothers me on occasions like these is that as we look at the history of our people, not only in this country, because one thing about Brother Malcolm X, nothing that he did was parochial, so I, nothing that you will hear here, at least not from me and certainly not from most of the panelists, will be in a parochial context. But one of the things that always uh, saddens me is that um, as we look globally at the problems of African American people and African leadership, African people in general, we find that there's some disturbing historical parallels between what happens at the mass level, if you will, the kind of fratricidal violence where we destroy one another at the popular level, and of course we all lament that, we complain about the, what's happening to our people, and, but then there's always an explanation, we say, well, they don't know better, they're not conscious, they're not educated, they're not informed. But then again, we look at amongst the more enlightened, supposedly, sector, the more progressive elements, and what do we see? If you look historically, in our lifetime, at the great African leaders who have been cut down in the prime of their lives, whether we're talking about Malcolm X, or whether we're talking about people like Walter Rodney of Guyana, or whether we're talking about uh, Motala Mohammed of Nigeria, Amilcar Cabral, Eduardo Mandelani, we could go down, the list is empty, is endless. We find some disturbing parallels that invariably, with very few exceptions, the hands of the assassin always turns out to be one of us. And we need to deal with that reality. And unfortunately, it is often one of us who claims to be about what the person who they killed, it was supposed to be about. It's, so I don't understand it. It's something that puzzles me. And there's also a methodology that also is quite puzzling. Before these leaders are taken out, we hear many people calling for them to be taken out. Then there's a post-murder sort of psychosis that is also baffling to me. After he's murdered, there's the denial thing. Then there's the braggadocio thing. And then there's the embracement thing. You know, we eventually we move to a point where even the ones who did the, the killings begin to embrace those who have been killed. I don't understand it. We need to understand it. I don't understand it. There's also a methodology of brutality, both in rhetoric and in terms of the physical destruction of these leaders. If you look at what happened to Brother Walter Rodney in Guyana, he was blown away by an African man who professed to be a Marxist, just as Walter Rodney was. The brother was cut in half, severed. If you look at what happened to Eduardo Mandelani in, in Mozambique, he was of, of Mozambique. In 1967, his head was split open by a bomb. Maurice Bishop, in 1983, when they lined that brother and sisters like Jacqueline Kreft up against the wall and shot her in her stomach when they heard that she was supposed to be pregnant. Again, the very people who killed him, later on, of course, after boasting that they had done so, we have the tapes, they called in our radio station on October 20, 20th of 1983, bragging how the proletarian revolution had just begun and how they had been victorious. Two days later, they were whining that they had nothing to do with it. And of course, we have supposed progressives going around trying to free them from, the, uh, from, from, from prison. If we look at other examples, whether it's Motala Mohammed, and we look at other examples and we see the same pattern of destruction and, and brutality against our own, our own people. So I would hope that today, as we look at the realities in, in which we are, we are meeting here today, when we look at the national situation in which our people find ourselves, we're not just coming here because we had nothing else to do today. We're not just coming here to say, well, oh, Malcolm is, is 30 years since Malcolm is dead. We're here to, to search for answers, to go move beyond this. And one of the things that we, we're doing is also to look at how, at, at the timing and the context in which we are, we are gathering here today. If you look at what's going on in this country, there's no question but that fascism is on the rise. And there is no question but that the, 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 those who are most victimized by this new fascism are people of African descent. Of course others are. People of color in general are. In particular women are, across the racial divide, are victimized by this new fascism. But there's a particular brutal manifestation against black people. There's a war against black women. When they speak of the young uh, single mother 
It's a euphemism for black women. Of the so-called teenage mother, it's a war against the young sister, against the so-called welfare mother, etc. And I don't have to tell you what's happening to the imagery of the African man in public media, whether it's the OJs or the, the Tysons or the uh, uh, Fergusons or the uh, Strawberries, you name it. And if you look at the administration and you look at the principal figures who are under investigation, one after the other, SP, Brown, down the line, it's always our people who are foremost uh, are, are the point of focus of this new kind of harassment. And that is symptomatic of the larger problem that black people as a whole uh, never before, uh, rather never, uh, ha never uh, have we seen what we're seeing now in, in quite some time in history, uh, we're seeing the kind of harassment of, of black people as we're witnessing now. And of course internationally it's no different. Our situation is no different. So today when we meet, as our brother Ferguson warned me before we came up here, that we should keep our presentation short, I would ask that the, the presenters remember that Malcolm X not only looked at the problems which were internal to the United States, but looked at the problem of people, our African people here in a larger global context. He looked at what's happening in Africa, what he here today, and he were to look at what's happening in our hemisphere. And he looked at these new global alliances, economic alliances, which are bringing massive economic powers in alliance against other massive economic blocks. One thing that is glaringly, blindingly clear is that the African doesn't fit into these, these new alliances. There is no Africa in NAFTA. There is no Africa in, in, in the European Union's uh, equation. There is, no, na there is no Africa in the new Asian alliances. And when the Chinese make their grand revolutionary and economic, economic strides, there is no consideration for Africa. There is no bailout plan for Africa. Africa, which has the richest continent, 12 and a half million square miles of the richest piece of real estate in the world, regrettably and tragically, is home of some of the poorest people on the planet. That's the reality in which we are, we are operating today. So our mission here this evening, I would hope, is that Malcolm X's remembrance and that our reflection upon what his contributions were uh, and what his life uh, was all about would be looked at uh, against the backdrop of trying to heal what has happened. After all, if one looked at what has happened with uh, Sister Kabila a few weeks ago, how can we say that this is over? Uh, brother Wilfred was here, Malcolm's brother was here a few days ago, and in talking with him, many things he wasn't able to say publicly, but he did share many things with us. It isn't over. And until and unless we are honest with ourselves, we stop deceiving one another, I don't believe that we will be here next year on the 31st anniversary talking about building a coalition, which is what we ought to be talking about, rather than looking back at what happened. Because there's just too many ghosts in our blood that we need to, to deal with. We need to exercise, not the positive ones. We need to exercise these. So at this point, I'd like to begin our program today by asking our first speaker, Brother Tony Martin, to uh, take all of 10 minutes to address the audience. And um, some of you know Brother Tony Martin, uh, having written one of the most important books, many people have difficulty with it, but I think it's one of the most important books that's ever been written, a book entitled Race First. Uh, the title is a bit misleading, uh, because it's a lot more than what it, it might imply. Um, you may have read a lot about him in recent months, about got some problems he's been having with certain authorities in the halls of academe in Boston. I'll let him tell you about that. Please welcome uh, Professor Tony Martin, author of Race First and many others. Thank you very much, Brother Samori, and thank you very much to the members of the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee for inviting me here tonight. I thought I had 15 minutes, but I just lost five, so I'll try to move as fast as I can. The title of the topic that I had for tonight was Malcolm, Garvey, and Co-Intel Pro. Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, and Co-Intel Pro. And what I had planned to do was not to talk about Malcolm per se, but to, to sort of uh, sketch in part of the historical background to the harassment that our leaders have had over the years. America, as everybody here knows, has been at war with black leaders for several hundred years. Those of our leaders who have been considered radical by the powers that be have borne the brunt of this oppression from the powers that be. However, 
in the final analysis, all of our leaders of whatever ideological persuasion have come under governmental harassment at the point where they have been seen to be effective in mobilizing our people. Those leaders who have been the most radical, who have been nationalists, who have preached self-reliance, do for self, have come under the most pressure. But even the integrationists, even those we consider mainstream, have come under pressure and been harassed, sometimes killed, at the point where they have been seen to be effective. Somebody as conservative as Booker T. Washington was actually beaten up in New York in 1911. Most folks forget that. Of course, in our own time, we have Martin Luther King, Jr., perhaps the most acceptable of our leaders to the powers that be in this society, but even King was not beyond being harassed, being a subject of a co-interpro harassment when it appeared as though King, despite his relative, his relatively you know, um, non-threatening posture, nevertheless seemed poised to mobilize large numbers of our people successfully. Now, in the case of Gavi, we have one of the early examples of this escalating harassment against our leaders. And in many ways, it is not a bad idea to, to deal with Gavi in the context of Malcolm. In my opinion, perhaps none of the leaders of our people in the Black Power era came closest to Gavi in terms of his ideas, in terms of his rhetoric. When I read Malcolm very often, it's almost like reading Gavi all over again. And of course, this is not a coincidence. As we know, and I understand that Malcolm's brother was in town and may have reinforced this, but as we know, Malcolm grew up in a household that was very much a Garveyite household. His father was head of Garvey's organization, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, in Milwaukee, in Omaha, Nebraska, in Lansing, Michigan, and in other towns and cities around Michigan as well. We know that Malcolm's mother was also the secretary of Garvey's UNIA in all of these places. Some of this may explain perhaps some subconscious transmission of Garveyite ideas to Malcolm as he was growing up. There's one fascinating connection in the context of governmental harassment of our leaders. There's one fascinating connection between Malcolm and Garvey, and that is in the figure of J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah. Most of us in this room are familiar, of course, with the COINTELPRO uh, oppression campaign against the black movement in the 1960s spearheaded by the FBI, and particularly by J. Edgar Hoover, who, as you know, was head of the FBI for about half a century. It was J. Edgar Hoover who set and trained the dirty tricks that possibly may have contributed to the deaths of people like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and others. Many of the documents of COINTELPRO, as many of us in this room know, have been made public over the years. We know, for example, that COINTELPRO, through its FBI agents, planted black agents in uh, you know, a variety of black organizations. Like I said, they have had something to do with the assassination of our leaders. We know that Martin Luther King had bugs planted in his hotel rooms and tapes were made and sent to his wife and so on, alleging you know, uh, misconduct with other women and so on. But the fascinating connection between COINTELPRO of the 60s and Malcolm on the one hand and Garvey is that the very same J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI who was masterminding these dirty tricks in the 1960s. He was the same one who was doing the same thing against Marcus Garvey as early as 1919. For half a century, practically, J. Edgar Hoover, more than any other single individual, was engaged in this incredible harassment of black leaders. And what I want to do for the next five minutes that's left to me is simply to go through some of the tactics used by the governmental agencies by Hoover and his agents back in 1919. This is even before the FBI was organized. In 1919, there was no FBI, but there was a, a precursor to the FBI, something they called the Bureau of Investigation of the Department of Justice. It was a forerunner of the FBI. There was no federal in front of the Bureau of Investigation yet. So let me give you an idea of the kinds of dirty tricks that Hoover and his agents perpetrated against Garvey, and you'll see obviously the connection between what happened then, what happened in the 60s, and what will happen again, if we are not careful. They say that knowledge is power, and my hope is that this knowledge will make us aware of the continuing and deep tradition of harassment of our leaders, in the hope that perhaps some strategy may be able to be devised at some point to deal with this ongoing major problem. In my book, Race First, I have a quotation from J. Edgar Hoover, 
It dates back to 1919. This was three years after Marcus Garvey came to this country, 1919. And Hoover says in this quotation something along these lines. I'm quoting from memory, but he says something like this. He said, Marcus Garvey is a West Indian agitator in New York, he said. He said Garvey is an exceptional author. He goes on to say something like this. He says, quote, he says, unfortunately, Garvey has not as yet committed any federal crime, you know, which will give us a pretext to move against them and deport him. So here you have Hoover in 1919 already, an important official supposedly in maintaining law and order in this country, but he is hoping that Marcus Garvey will commit an offense which will give him an excuse to move against Garvey and deport him. Among the tactics used against Garvey would be the following, the basic question of surveillance. Garvey came to this country in 1916 and within one year, in 1917, Garvey had a big mass meeting here in Harlem after the East St. Louis riots. In the summer of 1917, the white population in East St. Louis, Illinois, surrounded the black community and set it on fire. They killed over 100 black men, women, and children. And as black folk tried to escape the flames, they were cut to pieces and shot and so on. It was one of the greatest massacres of black people in the era of lynching in this country. Garvey had a big mass meeting here in New York to protest. And very interestingly, in the account that Garvey wrote of this meeting, he says that there was a very large presence in the audience of secret service men. This is within one year of Garvey, and, and this is symptomatic of the kind of surveillance that was placed on him almost from day one. One of the, one of the important tactics used in Garvey's time was a tactic that we saw with Markham and with others in the 1960s, and we see up to today, and that was the tactic of infiltrating black people, and Brother Samori mentioned it a minute ago, infiltrating black people into black organizations to do the dirty work of those in power. Of course, we saw it in any number of places in the 1960s. We know that Malcolm's bodyguard, the day he was killed, they say was an FBI agent. We know that when uh, Fred Hampton was killed, the Black Panther in Chicago, 1968 or 69, we know that the man who was his bodyguard was an FBI agent, black man. The, the, the man drugged, drugged Hampton the night the FBI agents were supposed to, to come to shoot up the place where Hampton was sleeping. This black guy who was supposed to be his bodyguard but was in fact looking for the FBI, drugged Fred Hampton. The man couldn't, couldn't even get out of his bed when the bullets started to come through the walls, died in his bed. Couldn't, couldn't get out of his bed. And this tactic we see in Garvey's time, 50 years earlier, the very same powers that be were perpetrating the same tactics against people like Marcus Garvey. When I was doing my research on race first, I came across an interesting item there in the, it must have been in, his, in the State Department files or the Department of Justice files. There was this black man and they were actually going to Congress to, spot, to, to, to pass a special appropriations bill. They, they had to pass a special private bill of some kind in order to get funds to pay this man in Baltimore. And what were they paying him for? They were paying him because they had hired him to go and attend a meeting of Marcus Garvey's organization in Baltimore to take shorthand notes. In those days, I don't suppose they had electronic bugs yet, I don't know. So they had to get somebody who was expert in shorthand. And of course, Garvey didn't let white people in his meetings, so they couldn't hire a white person. They were forced to find a black person to do the dirty work. And so here was this man. And of course, this material wasn't supposed to be divulged, but of course, 50 years later, you know, people like myself, historians, are privy to this kind of information. There were many other black agents who were infiltrated into Garvey's movement. Garvey once said, that a large portion of his you know, advisors and so on probably were in the pay of the government. Some of the people now we know, now that the FBI files are open many years later, now historians can read the files for themselves. And now we know that some of these agents actually became black agents, actually got very close to Garvey, people who he trusted. You, know, you have reports in the FBI files of people who were close to Garvey, who were able to, to report confidences back to the FBI. And of course, it, you know, it raises a whole specter of all kinds of problems. It's enough to make anybody paranoid, of course, you know, who is trying to uplift our people by building an organization. One of the sources that the powers that be used in Garvey's time and have used since and will continue to use are people like disgruntled employees. When Garvey was 
brought a trial in 1923 for alleged mail fraud in connection with the Black Star Line Steamship Company. The powers that be sent out letters to so something like 35,000 shareholders of the Black Star Line trying to find somebody. They knew that you know, the odds were in their favor. If they wrote all 35,000 shareholders, somebody out there would have to be a little upset enough to come and collaborate with them to build a case against Garvey. I think they got about 20 people out of 35,000, but that was enough. That's all they needed. Two or three people to come into the courthouse and testify. And they were able to use some disgruntled people who had invested in Garvey's um, steamship company like that. They were able to get one or two disgruntled employees who thought they weren't being paid as much as they were worth. There was one old man from Trinidad who had basically been rescued, pulled out of the gutter by Garvey, and invented to a high position. And he was one of those who figured he needed more salary. And to Garvey's great horror, this man turned up testifying against them for the government when the time came. There were people who were ideologically opposed to Garvey, and this in our time continues to be a major source of, uh, you know, of, of ammunition for the powers that be who want to use black folk one against the other. Folks who had ideological differences with Garvey, and because of the ideological differences were willing to go and collaborate even with the enemies of the race. Garvey once said, there's honor even among thieves, he said. He said there's honor even among thieves. But he said some of our own people apparently don't even come up to the level of thieves. You know, they're willing to sell their people out for, 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 for very little. So, and so you had people like, like there was a man from a, what was called Basuto land, down near South Africa, now called Lesotho, a man who was a black conservative, you might say, in today's terminology. And he actually went with the government. He had public meetings against Garvey and so on. There was the integrationist group, people like Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois, who had an ideological difference with Garvey, and who became, again, you know, very easy ammunition to be used against Garvey. You had people like Du Bois actually collaborating with the government, writing to the Secretary of State of this country, asking for money to set up a rival steamship company. Du Bois did that. He wanted money to set up a rival steamship company to compete with Garvey's Black Star Line Steamship Corporation. When Garvey was indicted in 1922, you had eight of the leading integrationist leaders in this country, people who were in the Urban League, in the NAACP, and such like integrationist organizations, eight of the major mainstream civil rights leaders among our people in 1922 actually wrote a letter to the Attorney General of the USA Okay, begging him to put Garvey in jail. The courts, one more minute, the courts, the courts then as now became a major vehicle, you know, used by the government. Garvey was, every year Garvey had a convention, they would arrest him in the middle of his convention every year to force him to pay legal fees and so on, you know, waste his time. When he was finally sent to jail, again, it was a trumped up charge of mail fraud. They deported him illegally. Non-governmental agencies, let, let me end by saying that non-governmental agencies then, and I'm sure the same is true now, were also used by the government. The government came at our leaders from a variety of angles, not only directly as the government, but sometimes indirectly through what appeared to be non-governmental agencies. In Garvey's time, there was something, an agency of businessmen, known as the National Civic Federation, and they were part of that surveillance against Garvey. There was the NAACP, which was part of that campaign against Garvey, you know, doing the government's dirty work. There was organized jury, then as now. As a matter of fact, there were some revelations in 1993 suggesting that um, Joel Spingarn, the Jewish leader of the NAACP in Garvey's time, was actually spying not only on Garvey, but on his own NAACP for the government while he was head. This is a Jew head of the NAACP using his position to spy on the same NAACP leaders, the same Du Boises who he was using against Garvey, he was sim simultaneously spying on them too for what was known as the Military Intelligence Department. The man who sent Garvey to jail unjustly was Julian Mack, who was the head of the Zionist Organization of America. He was also head of the American Jewish Committee. He was a founder of the American Jewish uh, Congress as well. 
So you had all of these governmental and non-governmental agencies moving against Gavi, and like I said, knowledge is power. So if we are aware of the tactics that they've used historically, hopefully somebody may be able to use this knowledge to devise some kind of a strategy for coping now and in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. We have a problem. It is a black Maxima out front. The li uh, license number is A191MX that's blocking the front. Would somebody please uh, remove that? That's a Maxima A191MX. Hopefully you'll move that. Uh, we want to move things along quickly and remind you that there will be hopefully an extensive question and, uh, question and answer period. So anything that we weren't able to touch on now, we'll have time to do later on. At this point, I'd like to welcome uh, the next speaker, uh, Professor Bill Sales, who is the author of a, also a new book on Malcolm X, which we urge you to pick up in the back. Uh, Brother Sales, for years, has written a number of uh, articles and pamphlets on the works of Malcolm X and other African American and African leaders. We will hear from him also for nine minutes, and then we'll have an extended period. See, if they go over, the next person loses one. Bill Sales. Uh, thank you, Brother Samora. It's my privilege to be here again at our annual commemoration of our black shining prince, uh, Malcolm X. Tonight, in the brief period allotted to me, I'd like to do several things. I'd like to contextualize the latter period in, in Malcolm's political development and the period of his assassination. This contextualization will allow us to answer the question not only why Malcolm was killed, but why he was killed when he was killed. It will also tell us who benefited objectively from his assassination. First of all, we should understand that in the period 1963 to 1965, the Civil Rights Movement was in a crisis. This crisis was not necessarily apparent at that point. In those years, we're going to have the major civil rights legislation passed. We're going to have momentous demonstrations. We're going to have Dr. King getting international recognition and a Nobel Peace Prize. But within all of those victories, all right, were being sowed the seeds of a more fundamental defeat. And let me identify some of the uh, uh, things which were contributing to a crisis in the movement at this point. First of all, we were winning victories against legal discrimination where more and more black people were facing a new kind of discrimination, de facto discrimination. The reason for this was that over half of the population of black people in the first half of the 20th century had moved out of the South and moved into northern and western ghettos, where the characteristic feature of oppression was not legal discrimination, but was the de facto situation that we face day to day. All right? In fact, this movement of our people out of the rural South into the urban North was giving rise to a new class, a class of urban working people. And that class itself was burgeoning in the period under consideration, but it also was facing a crisis. Because even in the early 60s, we were beginning to see some of the first impacts of the post-industrial period on African Americans. More and more of our people in the cities were becoming long-term unemployed. They were losing any meaningful contact with the labor market, the characteristic forms of oppression that we're now well familiar with, but already well underway in the 60s. The movement was tailing behind this new development. More and more, we needed a nationwide movement to address these issues de facto discrimination. What we had, in fact, was a regional, southern-based movement, uh, which was not addressing those fundamental issues, all right? So we have, uh, you know, our folks in the ghettos in crisis, all right? If you look at the economic indices of, of, of how we were doing, if you discount the bloods who were just coming up in the first generation from South to North, the folks who've been around for a while weren't experiencing any improvement. They were getting frustrated, and so they hit the bricks and started to rebel. And so rebellions were beginning to be a, a characteristic feature uh, of this particular uh, uh, period. Right? As this was going on, the previous supported elements of the ruling class, right, which had supported the Southern Civil Rights Movement, began to erode into defect. 
as the movement came north, people began to discover all kind of reasons why they could no longer support the movement, up to and including those elements of the government which previously had been willing to endorse uh, uh, progressive civil rights legislation. We began to lose control of the nation's attention, that is, we no longer were able to monopolize popular concerns, that is, the civil rights movement. Rival movements emerged to compete with the national psychology, the student power movement, the feminist movement, and of course, above all, the Vietnam War movement, a movement which made many in this country believe that it was not possible to fund racial democracy at home while waging an imperialistic war abroad. Also, it's very important for us to understand that the civil rights movement, despite all of its motion and activism, had not generated any fundamental ideological critique of the American dream. It was actually rolling or ruling class ideology. And by the period 1963 to 65, it had run out of gas. It had exploited all the inconsistencies, all the contradictions, between what the country was supposed to be and what it was actually doing. But it needed something more in the area of ideas to push the struggle forward. And last but not least, the security apparatus of the state in the early uh, spring of 1963 had determined that the movement had become objectively a threat to the American social order and that it had to be more militantly monitored and uh, in fact, had to be in some sense crushed. <clears throat> now, I go into all that because this is the social context, the environment within which Malcolm X makes <clears throat> his important intervention. All right? Malcolm was one of the first to see that the American civil rights movement was in a crisis. All right? That it, this crisis demanded a new and a different direction if it were going to make the transition from a reformist regional movement to a revolutionary international movement. This is why Malcolm X left the nation of Islam, because he wanted to make an ideological, an organizational, and an activist intervention to help the civil rights movement turn the corner into the avenue of human rights. Now, on the eve of his own assassination, Malcolm X told Earl Grant, no matter what happens to me personally, the OAAU must continue to exist. All right? Out of Malcolm's own word, mouth, therefore, he gave to us his legacy. So it's very important for us to look at the OAAU, what it was in Malcolm's conception. All right? Why it was projected as an answer to the crisis facing the movement, and why, by understanding what the OAAU was, we'll get a clearer idea of why Malcolm X was assassinated. Oh, by the way, before I go on, I should mention many of these elements of crisis that appeared in the civil rights movement in the 1963-65 period are still with us today. Right? The questions that were thrown up by this crisis have still to be answered, and that's one of the reasons why Malcolm is still relevant today, because the situation he attempted to confront was never resolved by anybody or any social movement in the black community that has subsequently emerged, and therefore the unfinished business that Malcolm tried to address is still our unfinished business that we have to address. Right. Now, Malcolm X visualized the organization of Afro-American unity as an organizational vehicle for internationalizing our struggle. Right. He felt that it was absolutely essential for us to have an international vehicle if there was to be any possibility for us to succeed in our own liberation. All right. What Malcolm did in this period was to root his black nationalism squarely within the pan-African internationalist tradition. He recognized that a commitment to revolution was absolutely necessary if we were to be free. But his perspective on revolution deepened and broadened in the last 11 months of his life. He began to recognize that if we were going to make successful revolution in America, that there were certain international prerequisites. All right? We needed a high degree of cooperation and coordination across national boundaries between various oppressed races, peoples, and nationalities. Right. What Malcolm saw was that he wanted to struggle to give to African-American people 
an international personality as a national liberation movement. In order for the world to recognize that black people, in fact, were an internationally recognized liberation movement, it meant that we had to speak with a single voice. Malcolm couldn't go abroad and say one thing and be followed abroad the next day by James Farmer saying something else to be followed by some spokesperson for the NWACP saying the third thing and what happened. Therefore, it was necessary for him to come home from Africa and be about the process of building the Black United Front. That's what the organization Afro-American Unity was all about. The building of a Black United Front. With that Black United Front, Black people in America would it, would have for the first time an international personality and could make demands in the name of the nationality before international forums. Thus, Malcolm moderated his position in relation to the established civil rights organizations. But it's very important for us to recognize that Malcolm was not seeking unprincipled unity. He was not seeking unity at any cost. The OAAU was to be a black united front but a black united front with the agenda of working and poor dispossessed black people as its priority item on the agenda. In the area of electoral politics, Malcolm also recognized that if we were to make unique and innovative interventions in the American political order, that our activities had to be independent of the major parties and they had to be protected by internationally recognized guarantees. I think that's very important for us to see today. That if we know objectively that two-party politics, that the possibilities for progressive development in two-party politics have been exhausted, and we're thinking about an independent political thrust, then we also have to think about how we can develop some kind of international port, some kind of international monitoring for that kind of activity. Malcolm recognized this over 20 years ago. Now, so what I'm saying here, and I, I know I'm feeling the pressure of time, right? <laughs> All right? <laughs> Is that we have a movement in crisis. And what's important about Malcolm is that he started to ask the right kinds of questions about how we can get through this crisis and build a movement for national liberation that would have international support. Right? This attracted the attention of the security apparatus of the American state. Because Malcolm was right more than he was wrong. Right? And so monitoring of Malcolm was stepped up. When he came back from after the form of the OAAU, J. Edgar Hoover, four days after the formation of the OAAU, July 2nd, circulated a memo to all 50 offices of the FBI saying that the OAAU had been created by Malcolm. Malcolm was hanging around subversive elements nationally and internationally. He was going to go to international organizations and indict the United Nations, and therefore we have to put in place a counterintelligence operation to discredit Malcolm and the organization of Afro-American unity. That is, we can document that Malcolm and his organization were targeted for the destruction as of July 2nd, 1964. We can go back even further, actually. And it's important, in, in the little time I have available, I'm going to discipline myself and just make this point and maybe a wrap up and sit down, uh, is that Jagger Hoover goes before the Kennedy cabinet in April of 1963. And he says, fundamental changes have occurred in the civil rights struggle. The communists have taken it over. All right? Therefore, I want to step up surveillance. I want to violate these folks' rights even more so I can keep tabs on the situation. That was his public agenda with major decision makers in the Kennedy cabinet. Kennedy on down and said, go ahead and do it. All right? But Hoover had another agenda on his mind. He was not out to increase monitoring of the struggle. He was out to destroy it. The question is, why did he make a fundamental decision to destroy this movement in 1963? We've got to look at a few things, all right? And Malcolm was right on the case, right? When Malcolm looked at the disturbances in Birmingham in 1963, he saw the impact of a new social class on the situation, right? He said, did you notice Kennedy didn't send troops to Birmingham until the brothers did what? So the brothers got out on the street and started taking care of business, started setting the town on fire, right? And got beyond nonviolence. And then Kennedy said the troops. Why? Because that, not the Harlem Rebellion of 64, not the Watts Rebellion of 65, 
not Cleveland in the 60s, not Detroit and Newark in 67, but Birmingham as early as 1963, right, had given indication of the tremendous revolutionary potential of a new social force that was being born up inside the urban post-industrial order. Now, I'm going to peep that source, wanted to hook that up, right, with the international revolutionary forces for, for change and move our black struggle qualitatively to a different level. J. Edgar Hoover peeped that, right, and he made a move, and his move was successful. Why was his move successful? His move was successful because whenever you move, develop a movement, there are various points where it undergoes qualitative changes, where old leadership gives way to new leadership, where old constituencies give way to new constituencies, where regional movements become national and international uh, movements, where consensus among leadership breaks down, right? This all is necessary so that you can rebuild the movement and make it stronger. But in the period of this transition, right, your movement is going to be weak, it's going to be vulnerable, it's going to be subject to attack. And the security apparatus of the state recognizes that this is the time when you go over to the attack. Because it's most easily what? Done and affected at this point. So it's absolutely crucial to kill Malcolm and to kill him in 1965 before he institutionalized his two links domestically with the new social force, right? The brothers, the urban street people, the young angry men in our community. And secondly, where he would institutionalize our struggle with the anti-imperialist, anti-NATO forces in the world under the leadership of people like Kwame Nkrumah, Gamma Abdel Nasser, uh, uh, Sakano, Egypt, Indonesia, Mao Zedong, uh, 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 Fidel Castro, and a host of other people. Uh, let me just stop there and suggest that these are the kinds of considerations that we need to look at more deeply in talking about why Malcolm was killed, when he was killed. Excellent, excellent, uh, Brother Bill Sales. And I might have forgot to uh, make the point that we have uh, in our presence here on the panel some of the leading uh, intellectuals in the African community in this country. I don't say intellectual in any elitist way, but people who are scholars of the first order, Brother Bill Sales, Brother um, Zach Condon, of course, Brother Tony Martin, and others whom I'll mention later on. Just to move things along quickly, it's a, quick, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, tapes from this program will be available immediately following the forum in the back. Also, if you missed last year's event, those audio tapes will be available as well, and if you want videotapes from today, those will be available next week. So immediately afterwards in the back, you'll be able to get tapes of today's program. At this point, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. We're sort of moving rapidly along because we want to devote most of the time to an interchange with you, not uh, to have a bunch of speeches later on, but uh, questions from you. At this point, I'd like to introduce someone who, um, as a, to carry the cliche further, uh, needs to know uh, certainly very little in introduction, certainly in this community. And in a sense, uh, his presence here today, as far as I'm concerned, even though I'm not part of the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee as such, uh, it is indeed, uh, to me, indicative of the spirit of the committee in trying to move beyond the schisms and the, the antagonisms and contradictions to maybe try to bring about some easement of the tension and maybe uh, hopefully move towards solidarity and working together. Of course, I speak of uh, Brother uh, Minister Conrad Mohammed, who is uh, the New York representative of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who will speak with us now. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad. And we forever thank him for blessing us with our beloved leader and teacher, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, the Exalted Christ. And we thank the two of these great worthies over and over again for giving the black man and woman in this day and time a true champion, a true leader, a true benefactor, I speak of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. In their names, I greet you. Salam Alaikum. <laughs> and brothers and sisters, we are honored to be here, I think, 
Because if this is about brotherhood and unity, and if this is about settling an issue that has been in the black community for the last 30 years as a source of tension, as a source or point of disunity, then we're very happy to be here to help to bring about unity, to ease those tensions, and to bring the family back together. But if this is in any way an attempt to lambast or to throw stones or to criticize the nation of Islam, then we're also glad to be here to clear the air Now much has been said about the nation of Islam involved in the death of Malcolm X. And I think it's an intelligent question that you ask tonight, much more intelligent than the questions I've heard since I've been conscious and the last 30 years that we've asked. Not who killed Malcolm, but why was he killed? Because if you find out why he was killed, then you'll know who killed him. <laughs> really, we should be last. Because whenever an accusation is laid at the door of someone, the accuser should go first. We should not follow Zach, or, or precede Zach Kondo. Because we already know what he plans to say. We have read his book. We have heard him in the public charge the nation with the murder of Malcolm. But I want to deal with that tonight. Because I am nobody. I was one year old when Malcolm died. But I follow a great leader and teacher who was closer to Malcolm than anybody in this room. That knew Malcolm better. That loved Malcolm more that loved Malcolm when it wasn't fashionable to love him. The man I represent is more qualified than anyone in the country of talking about and representing the truth and the facts of this issue because he not only loved Malcolm, but he loved his leader and teacher, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, and often he was found in the middle of these two great men. You can't get around Farrakhan. Just as you cannot get around the honorable Elijah Muhammad when you speak of Malcolm. No, brother. It was not Malcolm's internationalism that caused him to die. It was not Malcolm's internationalism at all. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that there are 196,940,000 square miles of land on the planet Earth and it all belongs to the black man. You can't be more international than that. He said Africa is our throne. But the earth, he said, belonged to the righteous, and it is the earth that is the home of the black man and woman. He said, don't take one continent, take all seven, because you were there, you came before Columbus. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was not just an international teacher, but a universal teacher. And he took Malcolm from a thief, a con man. He reformed his life like he has done for us. He helped us to see the beauty in ourselves. He cleaned us up. He told us that our past goes back further than some little Black History Month accomplishments. This is Black History Month, the shortest month in the year. We're celebrating the accomplishments of our black brothers and sisters in the shortest and the coldest month of the year. So you've got to deal with the internationalism of the 
Honorable Elijah Muhammad because he's the one that put that truth and that knowledge in Malcolm's head. Yes, sir. So it couldn't be that Malcolm was killed because he became international. For from the time he came out of prison and recited his student enrollment and actual facts and became a registered Muslim with his name on the Lamb's Book of Life, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad promised him friendship in all walks of life. He promised him brotherhood with his black brother in Asia, his black brother in Africa. You are talking about internationalism in the 60s. Hell, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad went to prison in 1945 because he refused to fight his brown brother of Asia. history. The real reason Malcolm was killed, we got to deal with tonight. What is wrong with black people? We have lost Dr. King. We have lost Fred Hampton, Mark Clark. We lost Nat Turner. We lost Garvey. The list goes on and on. We've lost internationally Maurice Bishop, Patrice Lumumba, and the list goes on and on. But what is it about the black man? What is it in us? What are we afraid of? To point the finger at the real beast and brutalizer that has divided the black community for the last 500 years. We know who killed Malcolm. The same one that killed Garvey. We know that even though Shambi pulled the trigger on Lumumba, it was the white man's hand at the root of the pistol. It was the white man's mind in the stool pigeon, the Uncle Tom, the turncoat. And we fear telling the truth. Because we say, hell, if Malcolm got killed by the state, and I said, maybe I'll get killed. And the reason we are so afraid to accuse the real killers is the same reason we fight and kill each other in the streets of America, but we're afraid when the white man comes in a blue uniform. Because you can stand in front of a black man and say, kill me, nigga. But you're afraid of, your sh of the white man's shadow. And so for 30 years, a good man, a good organization, has been slammed by many people who had the chance to follow Malcolm, had the chance to be with him, but we're not with him in that day. But because today it's fashionable, because today you get some mileage, because today we are just like the people in Israel, we reject Moses, because Moses is dead and gone, but we don't want Jesus because Jesus is alive and in the world. We're always looking back. Who was the last leader killed? That's my leader. Who was the last leader that died? That was the only good leader. And I heard some fool today on television say that Malcolm is being revived today because the youth have no leadership. That's a damn lie. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is raising up black youth all over the country. Gang leaders, former murderers, former drug addicts, and drug dealers. Oh, you have to raise up a man from the grave you really don't want leadership. You want idol worship. You want to put his picture on the wall because he's dead and he can't ask anything of him. He can't tell you to stop smoking ganja. He can't tell you to kick your white woman out of bed. So that becomes your leader. And some of you, if you would be honest, you wouldn't follow Malcolm around the block. 
just like you wouldn't follow Garvey, just like, you know why we can say you wouldn't follow Malcolm today? Because you're not following nobody today. <laughs> Reading somebody's speech is not following them. Quoting somebody's speech is not following them. At what point do we begin to dedicate our lives to the principles that the man lived on? Some of you who love Malcolm, you yet cannot even reconcile the religion of Malcolm, which is Islam, which was at the root of his conversion. How you gonna love Malcolm and disregard his religion? It was not socialism that brought him from prison, took him from a life of crime, it was Islam. It was not nationalism that made him great and respectable and honorable, that men would leave their wife with him. It was the morality taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad rooted in religion. But we don't want to deal with that. So we make Malcolm a communist and a socialist and then say, ah, that's the reason he was killed. Because he became international in his thinking. Man, we've been lying to ourselves for too long. We're either lying or we don't know better. And if we don't know better, then what is wrong with sitting at the feet of a man that does know better? The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has been great in that he has admitted that he was a part of a climate that helped lead to the murder of Malcolm X. But what he didn't say, but what fair-minded people would understand was that Malcolm himself also participated in that climate. But when you don't like someone, you use their honesty as a means to strike at them. But truth requires that we be objective. And even when a man is honest and admits something that he did, it is incumbent upon the truth seeker to look into it, study it, and find out what the man is saying, not to use the man's statements to come against him. The fact of the matter is, Malcolm was killed because he could be killed. Malcolm was killed because we live in a society where the white man is like an angry and savage prowl of wolves. They're on the prowl, they're hungry, and they're looking for a stray lamb. Malcolm was killed because he cut himself off from his base. Malcolm was killed because the nation of Islam at that time represented the most formidable group in black America and the team of Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X was unbeatable. They could not kill the nation from without so they had to seek to do it from within. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, and don't you ever forget this brothers and sisters, that the mode of operation of the white man is to throw the rock and then hide his slimy hand as though he did nothing, getting brother to fight and kill brother, and then he steps in like the peacemaker. Today they can brag, today they can release FBI documents that brag about them engineering the split of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. And even with the white man telling you he killed Malcolm, you still, some of you, want to lay at the door of the messenger that he killed Malcolm. Well, in my conclusion, the question is, who killed Malcolm, or why was Malcolm killed? That's the critical question that will give you the answer to who killed him. If the Nation of Islam was a black organization, at that time, and it was known to the world that the nation and Malcolm were involved in a dispute, what would the nation of Islam have to gain from killing Malcolm X? We would absolutely have had nothing to gain 
but to earn the reputation of murderers and killers. Here the whole world is looking at the nation. The whole world is watching this public dispute that was played out over ABC, NBC, and every newspaper in the country. But would the Honorable Elijah Muhammad have to gain from killing Malcolm? Since after all, he was the leader of the nation. And if the nation killed him, all hands would point to Elijah. After all, it was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad who was scandalized by Malcolm all over the country for one year plus prior to his death. But when you believe in Allah, when you have faith in God, you don't seek to strike at those that strike at you. Because you understand, the Holy Quran says that Islam will be successful. Though the polytheists may be averse, we are guaranteed in this book success in every righteous endeavor. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, having come from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, facing the white man, facing the government, facing the hypocrites in his own household, had nothing to fear by Malcolm living. You want to say that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad feared that if Malcolm lived, the nation would be destroyed. Well, 30 years after Malcolm is dead, the nation is not destroyed, but it's bigger and stronger and more influential today than it ever was. And you say we killed him. Well, not some of you, but some of these. I'm sorry, but I don't walk into a setup. I get mine out first. I'm about to close now. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was going after black people. Seeking the black man. Seeking the black woman. In love with them. What would he have to gain in killing one from the own black family? See, you disrespect our intelligence and your own when you lay it at the door of the nation of Islam and you say, the nation killed Malcolm. Well, what nation? And who in a nation? When someone robs a bank, do you say America robbed a bank? When someone murders someone, do you say Christianity murdered someone? But you are just like the white man, some of you. You want to criminalize and scandalize Islam so that if anyone who is a follower of Islam does something wrong, you lay it at the door. This the Muslims. Well, that crackhead is not a Muslim. That man that broke into your house and cracked you upside your head, he wasn't a Muslim. Ask him what his religion is. He'd probably tell you Christianity. He'd probably tell you he was baptized. He'd probably tell you he went to church and Sunday school all his life. But you don't lay that at the door of Christianity. See, but when you have an axe to grind against someone. My final point is this. I think we proved the messenger had nothing to gain from killing Malcolm. And if you really want to know the truth about it, he told his followers, leave Malcolm alone. See, so I know some of you don't read scripture, but I, I just want to bring something to mind that's in the Bible. Don't get angry with me. <laughs> All of you have heard the king, heard of King David, haven't you? He was a great king. He was a little boy, but he was a warrior. But when he grew up and grew older, he had a son. That son's name was Absalom. And that son actually went astray on his father and began to scandalize his father before the nation. Oh yeah. And in a strange coincidence that's really not coincidental, at the root of his scandalizing his father was his father's domestic life. 
See, Malcolm knew that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had wives, but he knew the public didn't know. So he called them secretaries. But you say you're Afrocentric. You tell me how in an African Islamic country a man can have more than one wife. Where's the scandal in that, brother? Where's the scandal in that, sister? Where's the scandal, Christians? When David had more than one wife, Solomon had over a thousand wives and many concubines. You don't call them secretaries. And you got a lot of girlfriends yourself. So now I'll be like, Mama said, leave Malcolm alone. And he told Malcolm, remember, I have your key. See, when you know God, you don't fear man. If God brought him through one time, they said the FBI had the messenger in custody, had the gun to his head. I'm all right, brother. I'll be finishing one second. I thank you. But, you know, I know we're going to be under attack later, so I might as well get lob all these shells before I sit down. Because really, I should have demanded that we go last. Because Moses waited for the magicians of Pharaoh to cast their rod, then he cast. And I don't mean this to all the speakers, because I'm speaking of specific ones. He didn't fear Malcolm. He told his followers, leave him alone. You know why? Because we believe in the redemption of the black man and woman. And just as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad didn't ask Malcolm for a resume, didn't want to know what he had done in his life in 47 when he received him and anointed him and made him one of his great spokesmen, he then believed in redemption and toward the end of his life he believed in it also. But Absalom made his father angry and he made the followers of his father, father angry. So when you hear the Honorable Louis Farrakhan say that all Muslims were potential murderers of Malcolm at that time, what are you so surprised about? You have heard Malcolm on the television, on videotapes, speaking evil of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You know how you would feel if someone spoke evil of your leader, if you're a true follower. If someone spoke about your mother, you want to fight, don't you? If someone spoke about your father, you want to fight, don't you? Yes, if someone says something that you know is not true, and you know they know it's not true, you want to fight, don't you? Yes, so don't rob us of the right to love the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. For the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, yes, we would have killed anyone that came against the messenger then, today, and in the future. Yes, so ain't nothing changed. You know how we love our leader and teacher. Like you love yours. So finally, the government prevailed on Malcolm. And some of these same people that now are celebrating Malcolm, they didn't want Malcolm in the nation. So they enticed him to leave. Yes, Malcolm, you'd be a great leader on your own. Yes, you don't need Elijah Muhammad. But when Malcolm left the nation, he hardly had any followers. Because many times people will say they love you, but they don't show it by their dedication. They don't show it by their work. They don't show it by their love. And that's why most of you who are not in the nation, you can't understand the relationship that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had with Malcolm because you've never given yourself to a leader like Malcolm did. And so when you pulled Malcolm off his base, you not only pulled Malcolm from his source of strength, but you also put Malcolm in a position where the government could move on him, kill him, and then blame the Muslims for the murder. The last point I want to make, because I want to be respectful of the time, as much as possible. 
Zach Condo said there were FBI agents in the nation. But he hasn't proved it yet. Oh yeah, we know, as the messenger said, at a certain point the ranks were honeycombed with rotten characters. But I ask you if an agent in the nation was responsible for the murder of Malcolm, then how can you say the nation killed Malcolm? Was that chief of security that gave the plans of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark's apartment a panther? Did the Panthers kill Fred Hampton and Mark Clark? Hell no. Yeah, John Ali used to work with the FBI or some government agency. This is not a bombshell revelation. It was known by the messenger. It was known by the followers of the nation. That's because we don't care where you come from. You can join on to us. We have agents that come to the mosque. And after they sit under that truth for a few weeks, they come and confess. Say, brother, I came here with a government. But I see what y'all are doing. I'm with you now. But if John Ali was an FBI agent, question him. He's still alive. Thank you. I'll close at this time. There's so much more I want to say. But well, let's get on with the question. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Conrad Muhammad. Um, I'm glad to see the brother there that I respect the, the time and the program. Um, I actually, uh, we are, as I said, we are going to have an intense, hopefully extensive question and answer period. And we will be able to follow up on many of these items. I would just caution the speakers who would be following brother Conrad Muhammad not to depart from the format of our program as has just been the case. Uh, my, I, my intention when I accepted to moderate this program was that we would be conducting this, this in a spirit of uh, brotherhood and harmony. Uh, no one attacked anyone. No one attacked anyone. Zach Condo has even spoken yet. And I, so I would hope, please, please, so I would hope that the rest of the meeting will be conducted in that spirit. Uh, one of the things that, there used to be a, an old saying in the 60s, you know, say if you had a secret from most folks in the movement, all you had to do was put it in a book and it would remain there forever. Because some of us have difficulty really studying closely uh, documents. And one of the things that I respect this brother calls Zach Kondo for, I respect his work, and, and his conduct is the meticulousness of his research. I know Zach Condo, and I read Zach Condo's book. And it, it, nowhere in Zach Condo's book does it say, the nation of Islam came out of us. Nowhere, nowhere in Zach Condo's book, just so we could, just so we could be accurate, just so we, just so we could be honest, and as we like to say, we can speak the truth. Maybe we haven't, all haven't read the book. Maybe that's why we're saying that. But I'm here to tell you, nowhere in the book does Zach Condo accuse the nation of Islam, per se, of killing uh, Malcolm X. He speaks of elements being influenced by and, and cooperating with, with but, uh, the FBI and the state. On the question of uh, the white man and his responsibility for doing everything and so on, uh, that's something we'll take up later on. I don't know about you in the audience, but as an African, no one does my thinking for me. No one does my thinking for me. And hopefully uh, that applies to those who are involved in the assassination of Malcolm X as well. Uh, so the question of the revival of Malcolm X, I think, again, so we can clear the air, the fool, I don't know if it's the same program which the minister is referring to, but I heard uh, Malcolm X's brother, and I heard Gil Noble, and many others, and in, indeed I and many people like Yolande Breath and, and Brother Sonny Carson and others who are in the audience, we always refer to the re revival of Malcolm X. Not the body, I mean, that would be sheer nonsense to even think that we're speaking about the man. We're talking about the, Malcolm X's ideas, his work, his spirit, 
his political spirit. And yes, it is good that that is being revived. And we can't just begin a man's life in, in his teens. We have to look at the whole picture of Malcolm X and look at the roots of Malcolm X. So hopefully we'll look at uh, the totality of everything later on. As far as uh, the scandalization of Elijah Muhammad, um, I don't recall in the first year uh, such of Malcolm X's uh, life following the nation, his absence from the nation of Islam and his scandalization of the uh, of, Mal of Elijah Muhammad. Uh, finally, finally, it depends on how we define scandalization. Uh, the final point I'd like to make. The final point I'd like to make uh, by way of trying to clear things up so that we can have an intelligent discussion is that the question of uh, the willingness or the unwillingness of some of us to, to take on the U.S. state. I don't know of anyone on this, on this rostrum here, and I mean everybody on this rostrum, who has been willing to take on the United States government, to expose it for its treachery against African people, not only here but internationally, as some of us here, myself, Elon Brath and others, and indeed Zach Conner, if you read his work, Tony Martin, who has done an infinite amount of work elsewhere. But the, I'm simply summarizing a couple of quick points that the minister made, because it, it, it turned the, our discussion in a whole different direction. We, this is not what our intention was. We were talking, of, please, ex, please demonstrate some respect now so we could conduct this meeting. It has turned our meeting in a different direction, which I was hoping would not be the case. So what, I, what I'm hoping that we could do now by asking Brother Zach Conner, because I don't want Zach to launch into a defense of each of these points, hence by attempting to clear each one up as best I can in a limited time so that we don't get into a tit for tat and turn this into a debate between Minister Conrad Mohammed and Zach Conrad. Con That's not what this is all about. That's not what this is about. After the, the presentation by Zach Kondo, then we will have questions from you, and you can raise whatever points you want to make. Let me just see, uh, share a couple of program notes. You may have seen Brother Amir Barak's name on the program. He won't be here today, unfortunately. Uh, you also may have heard of Brother Kwame Ture, uh, advertisers being on this program. Unfortunately, he won't be here as well. And you, have, you may have seen also Brother Khaled Muhammad's name on the program. He's sitting on the rostrum, but he won't be speaking. Uh, he, won't, he will not be addressing the audience. So I just want to let you know that. However, during the question and answer period, if there's a direct question put to, to him, he will respond. At this point, let us please uh, give uh, a, a welcome to Brother Zach Kondo, author of Conspiracy. Thank you, Brother Zamai. Um, in keeping with uh, traditional African culture, uh, I need permission to speak from the elder. Uh, I've been told that Sister Vicki Garvey um, sits about the fourth row. Uh, I wish permission to speak, Sister. Did you see it? Oh, yeah. somewhat uh, unique, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I really don't have no, pro uh, no problem with that. I, I appreciate the words uh, that my brother, uh, Brother Conrad, who I've never met, uh, although I think we did uh, have a conversation over the radio last year. So anyway, I'm honored uh, to be here, and I'm also honored to uh, meet Brother uh, Khalid for the first time, and then I'm also honored to see some old friends. 
Now, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. My instinct right now is to go, um, is to address, I think I got around 13 issues that Conrad raised uh, that I would like to address, and I think I will address them. But before I do that, there are certain things that I would like to address first. One of the things that's bothering me right now as we address the assassination of Malcolm X 30 years later, and I'll just be very frank with you, is the energy of the nation of Islam. It's bothersome for a couple of reasons. One reason is because those of us who are struggling for our people understand very clearly that criticism is very important for struggle. In fact, it is, it is the responsibility It is the responsibility of those of us who are serious about our people, those of us who are serious about struggle, to be able to critique the mistakes that we've made in the past. Our leaders, we have no leaders who are above criticism. But unfortunately, it seems as though we have some organizations which has no problems whatsoever critiquing all other organizations. However, the same organization has a problem when it's critiqued. At some stage, at some stage, I think that we as a people need to make, need to be able to deal with that. Now, I don't have no problems. Malcolm made mistakes. Malcolm was a man. He went to the bathroom. He made mistakes. We don't have no problems with that. Elijah Muhammad, however, was a man too, and he made mistakes. Wow. The difference, however, is, is that it's okay for us to discuss Malcolm's mistakes. In fact, it's okay for us to chastise Malcolm. It's okay for us to say all types of negative things about Malcolm, to attack Malcolm's character, and to call Malcolm a Judas, and to call Malcolm a traitor. It's okay to do all of those types of things. But let somebody say something negative about Elijah Muhammad and a war begins. Something is wrong with that. And the same, thing, and the same case exists with Farrakhan. I have a lot of respect for Farrakhan. But one thing, one thing that I don't respect is the extent to which we have put certain people on pedestals. We put them up in the heavens. In fact, I'm reminded of something. I'm reminded some years ago, Ralph Abernathy, you remember him, he was King's, you know, number one lieutenant. He knew Martin Luther King better than Coretta Scott King. Okay, so see, <laughs> so y'all gonna read some stuff in this that I didn't say now. But this is the point. Before he died, published a book that dealt with his relationship with Martin Luther King. He gave us an insider's view of Martin Luther King. He was able to share information that only somebody who had struggled with this man, lived with this man, knew intricacies about this man. But Rev. Abernathy committed the cardinal sin. He had about a page and a half in a 345-page book in which he was critical of Martin Luther King. And not really critical. His point was to say that King was having an affair with this person here and met this woman here and there. And what ended up happening is people forgot about the other 343 pages in the book. Rev. Abernathy became a Judas. He became a traitor. He became somebody that at the time that he died, they had to have bodyguards around him when he was publicizing the book at book signings and stuff. Because one of us, 
might have hurt him. And here's a man in his 70s maybe, has struggled most of his adult life. He struggled for his people, took blows to the head. Crackers were spitting on him and kicking on him, putting bruises all on him for all those years. And this man had to die, basically. A traitor in the eyes of a lot of people. Why? Because what he tried to do was to bring Martin Luther King out of the heavens, make Martin Luther King the man that he was. And for that reason, that man ended up dying as a Judas. You know, it's interesting, you know, you can critique, and this is also going to go back now to Elijah Muhammad as well, you can critique a man. You cannot critique a God. You cannot critique a deity. We as African peoples need to be able to critique our leaders. Where Elijah Muhammad made an extraordinary contribution, we need to be able to understand it, to appreciate it, and emulate it. However, at the same time, where Elijah Muhammad made mistakes, we need to be able to critique it, to study it, to understand it, and to avoid it. And the same thing goes to the prayer. is that that will not take away from the leadership of an Elijah Muhammad. It will not take away from the leadership of a Farrakhan, nor will it take away from the leadership of a Malcolm or a Garvey or up to other leaders that we have. And we have to be able to do that for us to grow as a people. We have to be able to do that to understand struggle. Now, having said all of that, one of the points that I would like to, to make very, very quickly is let's now deal with Malcolm's assassination within the context of the Nation of Islam. Great, that's right. Now, first off, I want to deal with a point that my brother made as far as, um, he's, I think he said that I said that there were agents in the Nation of Islam. If, if you read my book, you will not see that I said that there were agents within the Nation of Islam. What I said is that there were informants within the Nation of Islam. The difference between an agent and an informant is that an agent is somebody that's been trained specifically by the enemy, going through their academy and all those other types of things. An informant was somebody who was already, oh, and then that person was then put to infiltrate the, the organization. An informant is someone who's already in the organization, who the enemy then approaches and says, yo, man, you want to make a few bucks and stuff, you know, all you got to do is do this, that, 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 that. That is what I talked about in the book. And that is real clear as far as the Nation of Islam and, unfortunately, just about every other damn organization that we had during the 1960s, you find that same thing. And that was also the case even in the cracker organizations as well. That's how the enemy was able to keep so uh, to keep tabs on a whole lot. The other thing is that I do not say John Ali was an FBI agent. One of the questions that I raised, in fact, in fact, one of my points is that if he was on anybody's payroll, most likely it was probably military intelligence, since he used to work for the Naval Department. Now, but I still want to deal with one other point that he made with regard to that, because I think his point was to say that if these people were agents, then you know it was the agents who killed Malcolm. You know, that's been an argument that I've heard now for the last, you know, for the last few years. And you know, on paper it sounds good. You know, so let's suppose, just for the sake of the enemy, say all of the people from Newark, including Tom Chair, who came into the Audubon Ballroom on February 21st, 1965 at 3.10 p.m., they came in there and they were all agents, okay, for the sake of argument. Every last one of them, you know, they were, they went to the academy or whatever, no, you know, or they were informants, it don't matter, okay, they're agents, they're informants, we don't care. And then they come in, as Muslims, they're in the nation of Islam, as far as anybody else knows, them, even though they're really not in the nation because they're agents, okay? And then they kill Malcolm. And that takes the nation off the hook. 
the nation did not kill Malcolm. You know what's wrong with that analysis? What's wrong with that analysis is that what exactly does that say about your organization if you allow the enemy to come into the organization, infiltrate the organization, kill somebody that the organization can't stand, and then all of a sudden you're innocent of this? What does that say about eternal security within your organization if that was the case? We need to deal with that issue. And the truth of the matter is, is this, even if they all were enemies, excuse me, even if they were, even if all of them were agents. We're not dealing with children here. We're dealing with the F4Y. We're dealing with, with, some, with some of the most organized, according to the image that they portray, some of the most organized brothers around and stuff. Some of the most serious brothers around. So we're going to allow, so the f is going to allow the enemy to go in there and take, I mean, the point that I'm trying to make is that it still would not resolve an accountability question. That's the point that I'm trying to make. going to really begin to surface. And when that began to happen, 
You could almost imagine seeing the enemy giving each other high fives. Because all they had to do at that stage of the game was to feed it. And they, feed, they fed it very well. They fed it through spreading rumors within the mosque, outside the mosque. They fed it by planting bogus newspaper articles. Some of the more specific ones you can go back, check out April 25th, 1963. New York Times was one good example of that. The point of all of this is, is that what the enemy did something that they had done for a long time. And they did it very well with regard to the nation of Islam. They would study organizations. And of course, they were listening to the telephone. They also had wired, the Chicago National Office was also wired. And what they were basically listening for was problems. Mostly between Malcolm and the national leadership and specifically between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. And each time through the radio, I mean, excuse me, through the, uh, through the telephone, each time through the uh, wiring in the national office, they heard a negative point. Maybe Elijah Muhammad might have said something or, or Herbert might have said something about Malcolm, et cetera, et cetera. Then that was something that the enemy could then exploit. And exploit they did. They would write bogus, Letters. I talked about the newspapers. The bad jacketing was the spreading of the false rumors. And it's not going to be any one thing. It's going to be the totality of all of these things that are then going to create more distance between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. And just to give you an idea of just how vicious the enemy was. Go back to May 1963. Elijah Muhammad is staying in Phoenix. They overhear a conversation in which Elijah Muhammad tells someone, Elijah Muhammad, by the way, at this time was very sick. He'd been throwing up blood. He was in a lot of pain. And other than having, you know, one or two uh, people watching him, he was basically the only one at the Phoenix estate. So he tells somebody over the phone. You know, he said, you know, sometimes I'm in such pain. It hurts so bad sometimes, you know, I just want to, I just, I, I just want to kill myself. And guess what the enemy did? For the next week, every day, two, three, four times a day, there was a series of phone calls to his estate encouraging him to kill himself. That's how the enemy works. We give them a little bit and they do their best to exploit it. The tragedy of Malcolm Elijah Muhammad situation is that we gave them lots to exploit. And they took advantage of it. And let me be real clear on this too. You know, I have never said that Malcolm had a halo on his head. Malcolm was not an angel. At the same time, however, Malcolm was not the devil that my brother tries to paint him out to be either. Same thing with Elijah Muhammad. You know, Elijah Muhammad was overall a good man. I always respected Elijah Muhammad. But that doesn't mean that I cannot critique him. So at any rate, in 19, during the 1960s, and in, in 1963 especially, that was really the key to all of this. The babies contributed to things, but it was actually greater than the babies. And by the way, Conrad said that for a year plus, Malcolm was attacking Elijah Muhammad. Uh, no. Uh, Malcolm first came out against Elijah Muhammad, and you can document this is well documented, publicly June 3rd, June 3rd, 1964. That's less than, that's nine months from the time that he was actually killed. So that's not a year plus. It wasn't even actually a year. And let me be also clear on this too. And you can just go check the archives of Muhammad Speaks. By the time Malcolm finally came out against Elijah Muhammad, the Nation of Islam, through various newspaper articles through Muhammad Speaks, had declared Malcolm basically a hypocrite and a traitor. And they had, they had held a news conference in March of that year in which Malcolm's brother Philbert 
had basically said Malcolm was sick and all these other types of things. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that Malcolm bit his tongue for about 90 days, for about three months after he had already been attacked and castrated and whatever by, by the nation of Islam. This is not Zach Kondo saying this, just go back and read Muhammad Speaks, read the newspaper. It's very clear. Yeah. One other point that I also, you know, since I'm kind of in the area where I said I, I wasn't going to go too far, I won't go too far. But I also find it a little ironic that when people, when African people appreciate Malcolm, um, you know, I think Conrad used the word, you know, we're basically dealing with idols, we're dealing with dead leaders. Um, and that's kind of bothersome, and, I, and I, I will tell you why. As an African person who has great appreciation for, you know, for traditional African culture, though I critique that as well, of course I'm supposed to, but one of the things that's always been very significant in traditional African culture is ancestry. You know, and we appreciate, you know, we appreciate ancestry. Um, and the key to being a good ancestor is evolves around the work that you did when you were alive. Not everybody who dies becomes an ancestor. If you did things that was worthy of being remembered by the living, that constitutes an ancestor. Well, Malcolm is an ancestor. And yes, he's dead, and that's okay. But the point of the matter is, is that just because you appreciate an ancestor, it doesn't mean that, you know, that, you know, that, that person is an idol or even that you're, at, you know, worshiping an idol or whatever you see. And just to bring this point home, you know, it's like we could make a similar argument with regard to Elijah Muhammad. But I don't think that we need to go there. In other words, I quote Elijah Muhammad. I read Elijah Muhammad. Does that mean that he's, you know, that, I mean, do we need to go with this idol stuff? Do we need to talk that? I think not. I think the problem here is that we should not have one standard for one ancestor and another standard for another. One other point, too, that I want to just, just say something about, that most people say piggyback on, but you know, I'm vegetarian, so I say vegetable back on. <laughs> My students say I'm dry. What do y'all think? <laughs> okay. Yeah, Elijah Muhammad did, did say, leave Malcolm alone on some occasions. But you also might want to go back to a speech Elijah Muhammad gave in Houston in June. 1964, in which he was actually talking about two people in this speech. He was talking about Wallace, his son. He was also talking about Malcolm. And uh, one of the points that he made in this speech was that hypocrites like them needed to be blasted off the face of the earth. Now, you can hear this yourself on tape. Now, now actually, you know, you know, there's a tape that you can hear, but the point of this is, is that obviously that's a little bit different than telling somebody you know, to leave this man alone. The truth of the matter is, is that at best, Elijah Muhammad sent, sent mixed signals with regard to Malcolm. And I think that was one of the, that was one of the problems in all of that, because during this period of time, and perhaps today, the FOI worked and moved based on post-suggestion, that is, you know, you just give out a certain amount of energy. You don't necessarily say, I want you to go do this and do that. You say certain things, and then the FOI person picks up the energy. Obviously, when you hear things like that, you know, you run the risk of certain people picking up energy, even if, now suppose for the sake of argument, that's not, you know, it was just figurative. He, he, he wasn't really meaning that. But you run the risk of people picking up that energy. In fact, Norman Butler, you know, Norman, you know, Norman 3X Butler, who was one of the brothers who, who did time, who was a former lieutenant at Mosque Number 7, he talks about, in June 1964, attending an FOI meeting, you know, right before Elijah Muhammad spoke at the Armory on June 28, 1964, in which Elijah Muhammad, I mean, excuse me, Elijah Jr. came forward and told, you know, let's go, you know, you know told him to go knock on Malcolm's door and beat, I mean, uh, knock on the walls of his home and beat, you know, and let him come tumbling down and, and cut out his tongue and send it to him. He'll put it in an envelope and stamp it approved and give it to the messenger. The problem with that is that, once again, if we're dealing with post-suggestion, and keep this in mind, Elijah Muhammad Jr. was, was generally viewed as the voice piece of his father. 
during this period of time, then again, that's not, you know, I don't think most people listening, certainly not Butler, and I talked to a few other people who were there that day. Obviously, you know, people are not going to interpret that to mean, um, you know, leave this man alone. <laughs> so the point of all of this is to say that at best, and then Elijah Muhammad spoke right after that, the next day or so, and it wasn't like he came forward and said, okay, what Junior said yesterday, I want y'all to disregard because he wasn't really speaking for me. No. Elijah Muhammad then went forward and said things in a similar way. So the truth of this, and the point that I'm just trying to make, is that at best, Elijah Muhammad sent mixed signals with regard to Malcolm. Now, one other point that he said, and this would be the last point that I want to address that he said, is that he said that Farrakhan is the person most qualified to really address this issue. And, you know, I concur. In fact, I think that one of the things that needs to happen, uh, and I think the sooner the better, you know, and, you know, is that I think Farrakhan really does need to deal with this. You know, when I was, uh, when I was in uh, D.C. not long ago, they were, they, they were interested in, in me debating uh, somebody, you know, from the nation as far as Malcolm's assassination. And my position was, you know, you know I'm, I, don't, I will debate anybody. I don't, I don't mind. In fact, when I was first contacted by Herman, then my advice was, why don't, you just, why don't you just let me and Conrad debate if that's what you want to do? I don't mind that. But my point to them was is that if you're going to get anybody, you need to get Farrakhan, because at best, any of his ministers, all they're going to basically do is what he tells them to say. Farrakhan does, in fact, need to deal with these issues, and he needs to deal with them in a serious way and not rely upon his ministers as articulate as they are, as brilliant as they are, as intelligent as they are, as capable as they are. Farrakhan, not his ministers, need to be able to deal with this issue. And they don't necessarily need to deal with it with me. You know, he can deal with it you know, with some of our other leaders and stuff, but the point of it is, is that it needs to be done. And a lot of times we really don't go very far in situations like this because unless somebody has really done a whole lot of work on this and a whole lot of research, and see Farrakhan again, because he was somebody who was, who was in all of that, you know, at best, all somebody is going to do is they might go through my book or something and they might come up with, you know, with a problem or, or one, and, you know, you know, one mistake or something like that or whatever. And then, you know, they got me. But that doesn't address, that doesn't address the issue. But that doesn't address the issue with regard to accountability. It doesn't address the issue with what do we learn from this? Because see, that's what bothers me right now, you know, based upon the walkout and stuff, is what exactly is it that we as a people learn when, when we have situations like this, and I'll be the first to admit, yes, this is a very sensitive issue, but you know what? It ain't just a sensitive issue just with the nation of Islam. It's also a sensitive issue to those people who appreciate Malcolm X. But what exactly is it do we learn when all we do is just kind of like close our mind? Oh, he's going to say, you know, I was accused before I even got, oh, you know, you know, I should go last because that condo is going to do this and that. The problem right now is that if the goal really is to try to deal with Malcolm's assassination and stuff, then at some stage of the game, at some stage of the game, we're just going to have to be honest. In other words, well, well, we made mistakes. And I'm talking about we as African people during, you know, in 1965 not the nation of Islam, when we as African people made mistakes, we need to be able to look at those mistakes so that eventually we can move on. Because you know what's sad? What's sad is that here we are 30 years later. The only reason that a Kabila Shabazz situation can exist is because we have not dealt with this issue What's sad is that if this latest, you know, situation, since this thing has happened, is any indication, 
is that we're not really dealing with it right now. And so, I guess, I guess it'd be interesting, hell, next year is what, the 31st anniversary, let's, let's see what comes out the woodwork with regard to that. We can resolve a lot of these problems. We can resolve a lot of these problems if we're just honest. Farrakhan, historically, has went back and forth. You can find speeches in which Farrakhan basically is bragging, yeah, we killed him, and, and, and whose business is it of you? And then sometimes we can find Farrakhan not bragging and saying they were all agents. And sometimes we can find Farrakhan and say, yeah, I contributed to the atmosphere and stuff, but, but we didn't kill him because a lot of Muhammad told him not to kill him and stuff like that. That does not contribute to us resolving this issue either. So the, the point of all of this is to say, if the goal is to resolve the issue, it's going to take us just basically being honest. Once and for all, and then, and then, you know what? I suspect, I suspect that once we start doing that, we're going to reach a point real soon in which this will no longer be an issue for us. And you know what? It's real simple. It works like this. It's real clear that they came out of the Newark Mosque. It's clear. And even if all of them were agents, the nation of Islam still has a responsibility in order because they use their vehicle to kill the man, okay? So let's just recite that real quickly. But this is what's interesting. If we can just deal with this on a serious tip, which will basically just require, okay, yeah, you know, we were, you know, we made a mistake, you know. It was wrong. And it was wrong. Because one of the great contradictions in all of this is that, you know, and, and, and even with the wolf tickets, you know, we always hear this and stuff. Isn't it kind of ironic, you think, that in many ways, Take somebody like me. In many ways, you know, it's kind of interesting. Here I am, you know, I'm in my you know, early 30s. I've been struggling since I was 12 years old for my people. And right now, I got brothers in this audience right now worried about my security. And it's kind of ironic, you know, that historically, historically, we have an organization historically very organized in many ways. But yet historically, the only people that they've ever really went after historically has been people who look just like everybody in this audience. Something's wrong with that. We need to be able to minimize, we need to minimize contradictions. And what I would suggest to you and I'm especially speaking to the brothers from the FOI. What I would suspect to you is that we really need to minimize these contradictions and stuff. I am not your enemy. And any other, and any other brother, any other brother or sister who criticizes you or even your past, which most of you wasn't even born when Malcolm was killed anyway. But the point of all of this is, is that just because somebody criticizes you, it doesn't make them your enemy, nor does it give you a right, you know, to you know, to to muscle them or to threaten them or anything like that. So, if nothing else, if nothing else, you know, if we can just start dealing with contradictions like that, then my trip and the brother who came with me, you know, coming up here today would be worth it. Thank you. Exchange, uh, brother, the minister Conrad Muhammad would like to we'll get about five minutes to respond to one or two points, and it will be five minutes. And Zach Condo, and Zach Condo will have an opportunity to respond in kind. Uh, a reminder for those of you who, if we're not fasting, and there's a whole lot of food in the cafeteria on sales so after the program. Please take advantage of it. Save your appetite. See, brothers and sisters, this is why I began by saying, I think it's an honor to be here. But it clearly is not. You can be dishonest and make it appear 
as though I changed the tone of the meeting. This is why the brother was scheduled to speak behind me. This is why there was no time sheet passed to him. And he basically gave a, an entire summary of his book. And now they want to bring him back up to exchange. Seems like he's always got to have the last word. But Allah is sufficient for us. I think in a few words, we can clear up some of this foolishness. First of all, the point I wanted to make, and I got cut off, I tried to respect the time as best as I could, and I stopped before I finished saying that David's son, Absalom, angered the followers of David. And ultimately, he went to war against David's army. David gave instructions. You can catch him, but don't kill him. One of the captains of David was so enraged, so zealous, he was so angry over the scandalizing, yes, I say scandalizing, because Malcolm knew that the women were the messenger's wives. And when you look at Malcolm, go before the white man and talk about the domestic life of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, what right did he have to do it? If someone went and talked about your domestic life now, you'd be quick to say, man, the brother didn't have to go in front of the devil. Because all of us got some skeleton in our, in, in our closet somewhere. No, all of us. Because if you're human, you got some skeletons. And if you're that righteous, then you need to throw a stone. But Jesus said, he that is without sin. This ain't no God group. So I know we got some sin in here. Now, one of the generals killed Absalom. He went against the instructions of David and killed him. And when the army came back, even though Israel was rejoicing, all you could hear was David wailing, moaning. And the scripture says the celebration turned into mourning. And all you could hear David was saying was, my son, my son, my son. See, you don't want to recognize the contribution that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad made in Malcolm's life, and you don't want to recognize that you don't invest in a man for 12 years and you don't love him. And so when Malcolm was killed, the messenger didn't celebrate because that was his product. And the other point that I did not get a chance to make or finish was that the messenger knew that it would have meant more for Malcolm to come back home and humble himself and to admit his error than to kill Malcolm. Because after all, now that Malcolm is dead, many of you worship him. Had he been living, you still would have been calling him a hater. Let's just be honest. See, now you can say what you say about Malcolm. But maybe some of you were around right at home. And instead of helping Malcolm, you debated him. Instead of helping him to be successful, you wanted to find some reason not to think that you can criticize the messenger. But what we resent is Negro academicians that have done nothing. Yeah. Because in Islam, we have a principle called jihad. And we fight with those who fight with us. And that's why when the police came to March number seven, we didn't bow down. We got a brother going to jail right now. Because whoever comes against us, we're going to fight. Our religion is a little different. It teaches us to fight with those who fight with us. But since you brought a little weak intellectual argument, we're going to fight with you on the basis of that weak historical argument. What does it say about the internal security of the nation? 
if agents come into our ranks? What does it say about God that there's a devil on the earth? Does it say that God is not God? You know why agents can get in the ranks of the nation? Because we don't turn any black man down. I don't care how bad he's in, what condition he's in, what trials and tribulations. So it's easy for a wise, crooked deceiver to come up to us and say, brother, I'm with you. What does it say about Malcolm? That on the day that he was assassinated, brother Gene, one of his trusted bodyguards, was an agent, informant, or whatever the hell you want to call him. But if you report on the devil, or to the devil on your people, you're an agent. I don't care if you're an author, FBI, CIA, or whatever you want to call them. Because I want to do something more with my life than make a case against my own people. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, no matter what the black man does, you can forgive him of any crime, even up to murder. And that's why he never looked at Malcolm's rap sheet. He never cared about what a black man had done. He said, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden. And if you had the same love for black people, you wouldn't spend a lifetime addressing an issue that contrary to what this brother said, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has already addressed. He did a lecture back in 1979 called Diamond Among Men, Malcolm X and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He has done several addresses since that time. And in our Savior's Day, 1993, he not only went before America, but he went before the world, Zach Kondo. You know it, but you're being dishonest. You're trying to make it appear that Farrakhan is avoiding this issue. He went before the world and laid his heart bare and said, yes, he helped to create a climate. Now what more can a man say? He didn't pull the trigger. If the murderers came out of Newark, he didn't know anything about it. And oh, incidentally, the reason why he was in Newark preaching on that day is because Malcolm was the regional minister in this city. And when Malcolm got sat down, James Shabazz, the minister in Newark, the ranking senior minister, was sent into New York. And all the other ministers on the East Coast were rotating into Newark to keep Muslims happy and fed in Newark. See, but when you don't know something and you write a book and you don't go to primary sources, you don't get proper information. Three more minutes, and then he gets an hour or more. All right. You say that there's a secret hand. That sounds like some of that double speak you're talking about. That sounds like some of those mixed signals that you're accusing us of. Either the nation killed Malcolm or the FBI or the CIA or the United States government, whatever agents. Don't try and have your cake and eat it too. If men who are agents came into the nation of Islam unbeknown to the nation, what can you lay at our door for the responsibility of that? After all, we were engaged in a fight. I have not condemned Malcolm tonight. I respect the great contributions of Malcolm. Malcolm walked before me that I might stand today. But as a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I can see where he went astray. I can see where he went astray, not just in the 11 months after he left the nation, but let's go back to 1963, when the messenger told him not to make statements to the press. He went to Miami Beach, and there are interviews right now that document that Malcolm was not abiding by that instruction. So you don't want to deal with that. But in truth, in truth, it still didn't justify killing. I'm in agreement with you. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has said we made mistakes in the past. Don't leave here tonight saying you got that out of us. 
our leader has already said that before the world. And he tells us today, don't fight your people. He tells us today, don't seek to take your brother's life. But what you got to understand, brothers and sisters, is that while Zach Kondo is in the university, comfortably, in a white man's in university, we're in the housing projects. And when I say a white man, many of your black universities are run by the white man too. We're in housing projects. We're in the worst communities, maybe somewhere Zach Condon wouldn't even walk. And we go with no weapons, no guns. And we try and improve the quality of life while he's yapping and writing our brothers, these men that you disparage tonight, the FOI, they're not bullies. They're in the community trying to make it safe for your mother, for your babies. And if a man approaches us with a gun, I don't give a damn what color he is. We're going to take the gun and beat the hell out of him. And if you come out of the university, you see the reality of this thing. When Moses went to civilize the Caucasians in Europe, he had to sleep in a ring of fire. See, most of you that don't really work with black people beyond an intellectual level, you romanticize struggle. But when you get out into the trenches, see, Malcolm knew this, and that's the hypocrisy in most of you. It was Malcolm that formed pipe squad. It was Malcolm that taught the brothers how to throw acid in the face of his enemies. So if the Muslims killed Malcolm, Malcolm had something to do with teaching us the technique. But you don't want to deal with that. The last thing I want to say. says see you don't want to deal with truth but the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan told Malcolm and it's in a book called the meaning of the FOI he told Malcolm he said brother you can't train the people to beat up the brothers and sisters outside of the mosque and think that it will not come into the house. Oh, we made many mistakes, but Malcolm was a part of that. I can only say to you that in this day, because the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan was blessed with living through this era, understanding the mistakes of the past, that he does not want to see the mistakes repeat themselves. And that's why no matter who has spoken out against him, he has not released the FOI on us, on them. He has not told us to fight. When Jesse rebuked him, he took it. When Don King rebuked him, he took it. When Mayor Barry took it. And not only did he send us out, but when they needed help, he went to their defense. See, you got to acknowledge the redemptive spirit. <clears throat> but if you don't know God, if you don't have a personal relationship with God, then your hearts are filled with rancor and you carry this bitterness to your grave. We don't raise this issue up. It's always people outside of the nation who raise the issue, throw the rock at our door, and then think that we're not supposed to respond. You out of your mind. Brother, you could be writing books on how to remove the scourge of drugs from our community. You could use some of that scholarship that you have to try and get the black man back into the home. You could be using your knowledge to help improve our people's condition, but self-hatred makes you always dig out a wound, and that's why the wound can't heal. And that's why Kabila Shabazz, right now, I'm not sitting down till I'm finished. This man takes an hour, then you're going to bring it back and you won't let me. I didn't ask for five, you gave me five. My leader and teacher in my nation is being scandalized. What do you have to fear of truth? 
The man spoke an hour. You're going to bring him back? Can I finish what I have to say? I, if you want me to sit down, I'll sit down and I'll leave. I want to suggest to you. Okay, let me suggest to you. But I want you to know. That when you when you don't want truth to be told, you bring up the time. No. I Okay, okay. So, you know, the point is, uh, you had an additional 15 minutes. I wanted to suggest to you that we're now going to go to the question and answer period, and there'll be an additional opportunity for you to talk, okay? Because we have to be out again some time. We all have to be, uh, we all have to abide by the same rules. Uh, at this point, we want to take some questions from the floor. Um, of course, we know that many people have speeches to make. I want to suggest that you hold them off and just just uh, deal with uh, questions, okay? Just questions. I want to show these brothers that uh, they have, they need not. <laughs> um, so that we, I said it uh, a few minutes ago, we didn't want to turn this into an exchange between uh, Brother Zach Condor on the one hand and Brother Conor and Muhammad on the other. There are several other panelists up here. Unfortunately, one of them had to leave. He came all the way from Boston, and he had to leave because of time. So let's uh, entertain some questions now. Could we please set the mic up? Is this the floor mic here? Okay. And we'll take some questions from the floor. Let me remind you that uh, they're, they're selling dinners downstairs to support the uh, Malcolm X Commemoration Committee and others. Please uh, feel free to partake. If you want a tape recording of this program immediately following, you can get it in the back of, uh, of the auditorium. I'm going to also caution the panelists that when you respond, that you keep your responses brief. If you don't mind, I would appreciate you stating your name or if you have an organization, organizational affiliation. Okay, my brother. Uh, one second, please. Okay, go ahead, please. Nothing? Which mic? Is it the, the black one? That's tall. This one? Yeah, yeah. Tall. Okay, go ahead. The other one is different. I said, all right, please. I really didn't want to come up first. Speak up first. Come up first. However, um, the time is so short that I'm not able to really get into what I would like to. But there were so many inaccuracies stated here today. You know, uh, Minister Malcolm was my minister, by the way. I'm a product of the nation of Islam, under the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And there's so many things were said, you know, there was inaccurate reference to the nation of that time that passed away in 1975. And it's a misunderstanding that the nation we're looking at today is the same nation on continuation, which is an inaccuracy. And no one understands or knows that or addresses that, so therefore we have a confusion right in that. And, you know, there's so many inaccuracies that, you know, that it really would take up too much of your time to go into it. And, uh, you know, separate the mics. I would like and I don't need to take up too much time. No, that's okay. We just want to get the feedback. This okay. particular point, um, the atmosphere was changed. And I'm a little pain and I hurt that it was changed by, by those of us that say we represent the nation. The reason why I'm hurt is because I'm a product of the nation. Malcolm was my minister. Elijah Muhammad was my leader. And the nation that I see before me today is not the nation that Elijah Muhammad is got. I didn't say it by applause. I didn't say it by applause because you didn't know what I'm talking about. All right, so don't do that. I'm not here to cause dissension, so don't you instigate dissension. The nation that I see before you, you see before you today is not the nation of Islam. It was designed by Farad Muhammad. 
who passed away in 1992, died in 1992, a repentant Muslim. It was designed by him to last 40 years, maybe a little longer, and that was it. So when we brought all these other elements in, I thought we came here to discuss something about al Hajj Malik al Shabazz. But when all these other elements were brought in, then confusion came in, and it just turned in out of whack. Now, I, I read Zach uh, Tondo's book. I didn't say anything in there he referred to uh, Elijah being the, the one that uh, killed Malcolm. I didn't say anything he said the nation killed Malcolm. I didn't see that. You know, in fact, the brother said he was on a hill, so I don't even understand why he was offered to come here. No disrespect to brother, I love him. He knows me well. I respect his ability to speak. I don't know why he was asked to come here on such a, a panel. And I don't even know why he accepted it, knowing that he couldn't, he couldn't deal with it in the light of what happened. Even Dr. Kalamama, I respect, he remained silent. I was there before him. I don't know how well he came out. But I think he could have shed more light, because at least he was in the nation that was then. See, and, 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 and it must be told, I mean, regardless to what, what kind of signals he said. You see, in the days and times of the foot of Islam, that I was a part of, you know, it was a whole different thing. So if you really want to get at the truth, you know, you, you should go at it from a different angle. Let, let's not bring decision and create this, uh, distraction and get people off from another angle. And all, all, I'll finish one, all due respect to you, Mr. Conrad, uh, you did not show, and no disrespect, but you said the pumps have to say to you, as your brother, you did not show very much understanding of what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught when you attacked that toddler even before he spoke. You don't know you don't know what he you don't know what he's going to say. And if he was going to say something that would attack you, you put yourself in a position to be vulnerable. Then people here to still love Malcolm and still love Elijah Muhammad, still love you. Right. See when you jump, see I was a knee jerk. You was afraid of what he might have said. Don't I mean that that make me feel bad. And when you said that no one, you know, Mr. Paul, I'm kind of nothing better than anyone else in here, well, that's a disrespect of me. You know, he was my minister. I walked, in, I walked into the ministry circle, but I walked and talked with him. You know, I know something about the brother, you know, and, and I'll close up with this. What Elijah Muhammad taught, what Farad taught him, and I repeat, uh, those two people are dead, and both of them repented from that teaching before they passed away. Elijah Muhammad repented from the teaching that he taught. Farad repented from the teaching before he passed away. See, you people don't know this. And maybe they don't know because they don't have the correct understanding of the nation of Islam. All right? Because it, many of you believe that Mr. Farad was the leader after Elijah Muhammad. That's not true. We all knew that Mr. Farad taught it. Who was going to be the next leader? He taught it. We understood that. And the next thing was supposed, his job was to dismantle the nature of Islam, which he did. Now, some of us, you know, we saw in love with something, we can't let it go. We want to go back and bring it back alive instead of our, well, I know some of you out here have seen El Cid. He died, but they lifted him up on a horse and raised him up to show it to the enemy. He like, I would have never put what's going on today and what was called the nature of Islam. Now, I know this doesn't assist us all, I know that's the signal. But I stand on the true Allah that is not a man. And I said to you from the lesson of the nation of Islam, I said Farah died. And then the lesson is saying, well, if he is not dead, bring him to him and show him to me. Bring your mystery, God. Now I stand on the true Allah of the universe. I'm not afraid. I have no faith in me. In fact, the Lord Muhammad took it out of me before I met the true Allah. So you shouldn't send the sisters home. That's the best. These are our people. That's right. I don't care what Jack that come and say. We've got to stop this fighting each other. Right. You know, stop breaking our jaw, man. You know, I ask you this question. The brother hit on it. In the, in the history, the 42 years of the of Islam, how many white folks was killed by the nation of Islam? Teach brother. I know, brother, that was whipped because it didn't sell papers. Peace. Don't stand on force, you stand on truth. Your brothers don't do it. Some of you I know, you're from the nation. Most of you, you're young, you don't know what's going on. You don't do it. You have an opportunity there to be a, a, a benefit to your people. 
But I'm a falsehood. I don't care who it is, stand up for truth. I mean, it's never, you know, this is ridiculous. There's so many things you can just, I can't even get to. How do you want to say what I'm saying right now? But I'm going to say it, man, listen. The nation of Islam died in 1975. Now, I don't know what they got in here today. I don't know what it stands for. All right? No, I'm not making no joke. No, ain't no joke. All right? No. Mr. Farquhar did not inherit the nation. Now, Elijah Muhammad did not point him in the direction of being the leader. And I can tell you some things that make your hair curl. He was not to succeed Elijah Muhammad. And it has to be told. So whatever you wish to do to me, hey, do it, man. I stand on truth. Yeah. Yeah. I don't need the response. The brother wants to say he cannot respond to me. He can't respond. He can't respond to me. How can he respond? Okay. Well, I believe the elder is in Islam, and we have great respect for you, even though. We strongly disagree with you. If I am not supposed to speak on such a panel, if I shouldn't be here, none of us should be here. Because Zach Kondo is just a little older than me. But yet he wrote a book on the subject. Because in this world, you can study history. And you can teach history from the study of it. The messenger said, the greatest subject to study is history. But I told you in the beginning, I was not around. I told you that I was one year old when Malcolm died. And I am just telling you what my leader and teacher has told me. I believe him. I feel that as one who was brought into the nation by Malcolm, who loved Malcolm, who walked very closely with Malcolm, he's the most qualified to represent Malcolm. And the last thing I will say on religious differences, Brother Wali, is from the 109th surah of the Quran. It reads, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, say, O oh, disbelievers, I serve not that which you serve, nor do you serve him who I serve, nor shall I serve that which you serve, nor do you serve him, a man, whom I serve. For you is your recompense, and for me is mine. Take the next question. I just want to make a comment, no question. Uh, pay respects to everybody that's up there. I have a great deal of respect for all the information givers that are in this room. I'm a young brother in the struggle. I just graduated from King College. My brother, Kami Muhammad, I pay homage to. And I'm disappointed because our mission is for African liberation. Okay? I have a great, like I said, I have a great deal of respect for the Nation of Islam. They've done great things. They've done things that no other black organization on this planet has been able to do. And I have a great deal of respect for that. In the same, in the same breath, I have a great deal of respect for Zach Condor. The, the brother knows uh, he has an idea of what's going on, and he can bring that to the forefront. But like the brother said before I spoke, let's stop fighting. We have a mission. We have a race to save. You know, that's, that's our mission. You know, if we want to, uh, propel ourselves into the 21st century, we have to stop this bickering. And at the same time, we can pay homage to Malcolm X. Malcolm was a great man. Understand, he, did, he was not a great man before he became al Haj Malik El Shabazz or Malcolm X. He was Malcolm Little. The brother had to be taught, and he was taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we have to acknowledge that, that's a part of history. The bottom line is, we can pay homage to our ancestors, we can pay homage to the lessons that we learn from history, but let's worship our, let's give support to our leaders that are here now in a physical reality, and let's also work with the common mission of freedom in the 21st century for African people. Just, just want to make a response to an element of, uh, 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 of the statement just made. 
Malcolm certainly was mentored by Elijah Muhammad, but he was mentored by many other very important forces that we tend to forget. From the earliest childhood, Malcolm was mentored in a Garveyite family, where both parents were present. And it took racists to extinguish, but only temporarily, that condition in Malcolm. Elijah Muhammad rescued him from the depths of prison, cleaned him up and taught him self-respect. But the jailhouse intellectual Bimbi taught him to respect the word and the power of the word. And that was an equally an important mentor in the, in the prison context. When Malcolm got back out here in the streets of Harlem, he became a product of the political culture of Harlem. Malcolm was taught in debates with all the nationalists and pan-Africanist intellectuals that occupied the street corners of 125th Street and, and Adam Clayton Town Boulevard and Lenox Avenue, which is now Malcolm X Boulevard. Malcolm was also a product of the radicalized intelligentsia who were also based in Harlem. People were very close to the African-American protest tradition who were pan-Africanists who were located in the Harlem Writers Guild. People like Killings, John Henry Clark, Julian Mayfield. Malcolm was also mentored by the expatriate community of African Americans in, in, in places like Ghana and Tanzania and Egypt. One of these people, Vicki Garvin, is right here tonight, who designed Malcolm's itinerary and showed him around Ghana. Malcolm was also mentored by revolutionaries on the continent of Africa and a revolutionary leadership. When he was at the Organization of African Unity Heads of State meeting in Cairo, he stayed on a boat in the Nile River with representatives of the revolutionary movement that took over Zanzibar, a representative of the ANC and the PAC and the Algerian Revolutionary Movement, among others. When he went to Ghana, he was received by the representatives of the revolutionary regime in Cuba, all right? And Malcolm, more than anything else, was a product of, a part of, and reflected the mentoring of a new social force, which we only got a small glimpse of in the 60s, but was the most dynamic force which emerged. That's what I call in my book, urban street people, all right? So it's incorrect for any one of these sources to claim a monopoly around the men mentorship of Malcolm X. What's so important about Malcolm is if you take that whole period of tumultuous upheaval, every positive force in our community was focusing that individual and therefore he, he reflected every positive source. Now our duty today is to learn the lessons of his experience and move on. Yeah. Move on to Pan African International. Move on to working class revolution. Move this thing forward. That's all we respond. This is so much to say here this evening, but I do want to say, um, first and foremost, um, I am also a product of the Nation of Islam. Um, I would like to give my brothers and sisters in the house a uh, Greetings, assalamu alaikum. Um, brothers, FOIs, a panel, I appreciate this forum today. I think that it's been very beneficial to where we need to be looking forward and how we want to move forward into this world that we're faced as of today. We can look back at who killed Malcolm and why they killed Malcolm and all other avenues of the uh, question around Malcolm, but I can say I was too a young student uh, when Brother Malcolm was killed. But I do want to say, during his time and of his struggle, I've seen no other man, I say, I have to say it again, I've seen no other man raise the black man into the street to organize themselves against the beast as Malcolm has done. And as coming up as a young sister, I very, very appreciate that. Today what I'm hearing and here, and I would have to say what I feel, I feel a lot of uh, a struggle, I feel a lot of class struggle, I feel a lot of I'm right and you wrong. But I say in this big world of America, none of us is, is definitely right, none of us is definitely wrong. But in order for us to move forward and how we want to stop this whole question around us fighting with one another, we have to organize ourselves around our common interests. And I think right now we have things other 
questioned in whether or not Brother Zach Book is beneficial or Brother Conrad's statement is beneficial. I want to raise a question around political prisoners. I want to know who is addressing the question around political prisoners and the whole issue as it is with our people being locked down in the dungeons and the belly of, 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 of America. I want to know, uh, uh, Brother Conrad, you had made a statement earlier, Brother, where the brothers are in the projects. I'm from Philadelphia area and I'm with an organization called African International. We also go into the projects. I don't see no one raising the question as, as an organized front around political prisoners like we raised the struggle here tonight about whether or not one book is right and the other book is wrong. And I think as a young mother raising a son, raising a son into this world. And I look around and I say, my Lord, when is my son going to be? Will he be confused about a right and a wrong? Or will he stand strong and take forward to the liberation of our people? I want somebody to comment to me whether or not, where is the nation going at right now in the liberation of our people? Not basically on the economic development strip because that is what's put so much on the forefront. But I, I need to know, as I see my brothers congregating here in such a large number, I mean a very large number, I don't see ever any turnouts like this here when we're questioning about Mumia and Geronimo and other people <laughs> Well, we, we certainly stand in solidarity with Brother Mumia Abu Jamal. We certainly stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters from the family of John Africa. The minister spoke 20 years ago or more on behalf of Angela Davis and Geronimo Pratt. And I continue to remember or to hear him speak on behalf of our people. So we are in solidarity. And believe me, everything that he's doing, you don't have a national leader today that is more in the forefront of the world challenging the white man and his oppression of our people, economically, politically, as well as judicially. And so we stand in solidarity, sister. And when you need us, We'll be there. We were asked to come here tonight. We are asked to come to many meetings. And whenever we ask, we try our very best to be there to support whatever cause black people are fighting for. And I'll leave you with this. The greatest thing the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan are doing today to stop and to end black men and women in prison is to teach us that knowledge that was taught to Malcolm, that made Malcolm wise enough as a Muslim, even though he was beating the hell out of the system, to avoid jail, to avoid prison. And this is the knowledge and teaching that we're giving to young black men all over the country to make them true revolutionaries, revolutionaries that are out on the street working in the black community rather than revolutionaries in jail. But of course, you can't always avoid that. And our brother right now, Brother Anthony, come on out here, brother. This brother may soon be a political prisoner because he was guilty of nothing but being at the mosque on a Sunday. And he was on the rostrum with me. I testified this in the devil's court, but they still convicted this honest brother. And now he is a convicted felon on three counts. So we are in unity and in solidarity with you in this program. Yes, uh, I was told to be brief, so uh, I want to address um, Mr. Kondo. Um, it seems that you, uh, you mentioned a few things subliminally, like who killed Malcolm, but you never issued why Malcolm was killed. That's why I came here. And I never heard you mention anything about why he was killed. And it seemed, it seemed to me that you was, like, <clears throat> blaming someone without blaming them. You know, if you want to blame somebody, come outright and say it. All right? Don't, don't say it in a few words. Okay. Thank you. Don't forget to patronize uh, the cuisine after the <laughs> You know, this is a, a peculiar situation for me because a few times in my life can I recall somebody uh, basically accusing me of not saying what I felt. 
So this is this is interesting. Um, no, actually, brother, your point. Uh, where are you? Your point is actually well taken. I, I kind of got sidetracked, and you know, maybe I should apologize uh, for that. Um, in my book, and since I'm since I'm up here, I thought I was going to get a rebuttal. I I I did. So let me just say this too. Just to kind of set the record straight, you know, I've kind of done a little bit more and work more with my life than just write the book on Malcolm's assassination. I've been struggling since I was 12 years old, and the Malcolm book was okay. The Malcolm book was my actually my seventh book, and I guess I'm I'm taking issue because anyway, anyway, I I just. I just felt the need to just let you know that Conrad and were not the only ones who've been struggling for our people. Um, there were many reasons that explain uh, why Malcolm was killed. Um, some of the more significant reasons was the threat that he posed as far as the intelligence community. And just let me just summarize real quickly. The major argument of my research is that Malcolm was killed as a result of three conspiracies coming together. The major conspiracy was orchestrated by the, the FBI. That was the secret hand that I alluded to earlier. And basically, in a nutshell, all they simply did was to exploit existing conditions. I think I did make that point. Now, what exactly was their major problem with Malcolm? There were several problems. A, Malcolm tried to internationalize the struggle of African people, taking it from the level of civil rights to human rights. Um, if you read the FBI documents, and, he, and in fact, you even go back to the newspaper, it's real clear that the enemies had the enemy had lots of problems with that. In addition, oh, I'm sorry. In addition to all of that, they also had a problem with Malcolm's domestic radicalism. You know, you might recall if you go back to the spring of 1964, Malcolm said some things, you know, that uh, really really teed off the enemy. You know, for example, he talked about organizing rifle clubs. Um, you know, he. Uh, he also gave a speech in which he flirted around the whole concept of black revolution. One point that we need to always keep in mind is that even when we deal with rhetoric sometimes, the enemy doesn't always interpret it just as rhetoric. What the enemy basically does is they look at not just the actuality, but they also look at the potentiality of all of that. This, of course, also uh, created a problem for Malcolm as well. They were also bothered by the fact that when Malcolm went to Africa especially, but also Asia, they were surprised at how other leaders, African leaders, Asian leaders, received him. That really bothered him because Malcolm was pretty much the chief critic. He, he was giving out the, the most surgical critique of United States foreign policy, of United States domestic policy during that time. They were real bothered by how so many of these African leaders were opening up doors and things for Malcolm, how certain Asian leaders Islamic leaders were opening up doors for Malcolm. That posed a problem too, because some of these nations were what was referred to as enemy nations of the United States, people who could then perhaps exploit someone like Malcolm. And I'm talking from the standpoint of the enemy now. They felt that you know certain people could exploit the uh, you know somebody like Malcolm and then basically use him as a club in order to make the United States look bad. Also keep this in mind too. You're talking about the Cold War. Malcolm's assassination. Malcolm's struggles has to be viewed within the context of the Cold War with regard to the United States' fight in the Soviet Union. You know, it was basically a war of friction, but what they were, what we have to be real, real conscious of is that when these Europeans were in the Cold War, uh, imagery meant a lot. Imagery, in some instances, meant everything. Other reasons is that Malcolm was very charismatic. If and I'm basing this on my research. It seems to me I can remember when Malcolm first. There's a lot of research. My brother, I they have research. I just want to say one thing. Yeah. They have research where they show Malcolm. You can get research where Malcolm used to send tapes, begging forgiveness, begging to be let back into the nation, begging, saying, "If you will only let me back in the nation, I will be." Content to just minister in the mosque. I will not want any limelight whatsoever. When he left the nation, Malcolm said, I am still uh, a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said, uh, I still believe he has the best solution. I'm going to have to encourage you. We're going to have to wonder. I think we have a question. I appreciate very much. Well, the question is, the question is, it's a statement and a question. What we must realize is this. Especially with this thing with Kubila Shabazz. First of all, the FBI wanted to save Farrakhan from death 
you know, it's preposterous. You know what I'm saying? It's preposterous. And now talking about Malcolm as I, the fallen leader and the fallen this and the fallen, he was a leader now. Back then, they called him the apostle of hate. So what, the, the question I'm, uh, where I'm getting at is this. There are people who love Malcolm, just like there are people who love Farrakhan, which when we was in this, just looking at what happened shows that. So uh, all in all, you don't have a question. I, <laughs> well, I have a lot to say, brother. But you're insane. All right. Okay. For us to unite, we talked about unity. For us to unite, the only way we're going to unite is the only way we're going to unite is if we get to the truth. Okay. I, so why don't we get to the truth? We got to be humble and get to the truth. I want to thank the panel, and I want to. Um, I came here, you know, expecting to hear um, an answer to the question, but I didn't get that. Um, and I can, and instead, I saw a lot of um, just div division and separation, and anger and fighting and debating, and you know, and we're, we're supposed to be uniting. We're not supposed to be dividing. And that's what I got. I have two girls that I'm raising, and I'd like to teach them unity, not division. And when I come to something like this and see us continuing to be divided, my question is, what are you going to do to bring us together and, un and unite us and move forward? That's my question. Um, I'm going to this morning. Let me just say this. We're here today to mark the 30th anniversary of uh, Malcolm X's assassination. Therefore, the whole premise of our being here is inherently contentious because there are a lot of questions that are unanswered about it. Just to explain why it is there are differences. There obviously one, uh, there is one point of view that Conrad Muhammad holds as an individual and, and certainly one that he represents as an organization. Uh, Zach Condo has other views. Bill Sales have, uh, has other views. I have certain views on that. So I'm saying it's good that these views are being aired. That's precisely what we're calling for. Let's put it out there. No, no, no. It's a, I'm saying we shouldn't always view this, these discussions as negative. Okay, but okay, let me see something right now. Let me see Minister Conrad. And no, no, he'll get to the question. He'll get to the question. He'll answer. No, I don't want to see. I don't want to answer. Let me see the both of them stand up together and give each other a hug. And let me see. Solve the question of who killed Malcolm X and why, and they said to me, so some of us are not into metaphysics, right? I want to make a brief response, and I tie it into what the young brother said. You see, brothers and sisters, again, sister, one of the reasons why we get so intense around this question, and that's why you have to excuse me if I jumped out first and took the defense. But as Brother Samori said, and he knew it, and the organizers knew it, the topic in and of itself is, is, is confrontation because great emotions are around this question. And the emotions tonight show us why Malcolm was killed. And it shows us who killed Malcolm. It was not in the interest of the nation to kill Malcolm. Now Malcolm is bigger in depth than he ever was in life. And 30 years later, we're still being accused of this. Who benefits from this? The white man. The white man benefits, brothers and sisters. And he played that thing exactly right. But where the emotions come from is that when you see a man like the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan apologize for his role, Admit that he helped to create the climate. But now say, let's move on. And yet others want to continue to attack him. That makes us who love him very upset because 
that does not show a spirit to forgive. That shows those inside of our community who hold up the name of Malcolm in many instances, but want to keep this division going. The last point I want to make ties into what the young brother said. I'm like you. I don't have a stake in this argument, a personal stake. I was not in the nation in that time. So whether you wanted to lay it at the nation's door or not, you can't lay it at my door. And you can't lay it at the door of many of these young Muslims. Because we absolutely had nothing to do with it. The autobiography of Malcolm woke many of us up. It was the first book that I read about the nation of Islam. And I loved Malcolm and actually hated the nation of Islam. But when I heard the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and he explained it as a brother, I accepted his word, his explanation, and out of the spirit of redemption and love, I submitted to him and allowed him to be my teacher. And I feel that that's what we should all do, allow the man's recognition of his error to suffice and then let us move on. We can't bring Malcolm back, and certainly Farrakhan should not commit kamikaze, or Harry Carey, whatever you call it. And let me say lastly, this new nation, under his leadership, can bridge the gap. We don't hate Malcolm. We see many of the great things that he did. We're inspired by many of the great things that he did. But you are not in our religion. So when you hear him say Malcolm turned hypocrite, you can't judge that if you're not a member of the Nation of Islam because you don't even know what that refers to. Malcolm held Master Farad Muhammad up as his God, right? Well, in Islam, in the Nation of Islam, in all religious people, when you hold up God, that's not like holding up a professor, an intellectual, where you have the freedom of saying you outgrew him? How can you outgrow God? So when you leave a religion and you turn heels on that, then that most surely qualifies you for spiritual hypocrisy. Now if you don't understand that, then don't try and understand it or relate to it because you don't come from a spiritual base and you have to be honest and admit that. Do you understand? But it doesn't mean we hate it. And it does mean that we can put an end to this conflict. But understand the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's emotions. Because Malcolm taught him to love the message. Malcolm taught him who God was. Malcolm taught him to be a vigorous defender of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the God of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So you got to understand that, brothers and sisters. And don't judge unless you walk in a man's shoes. Unless you're willing to submit to the spiritual teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, then you can't understand the way we feel. But let me say publicly that we will leave here tonight and let the word go out to the devils and agents that are amongst us, black and white. Zach Kondo, will never be the recipient of harm from the nation of Islam. We have waged a fight tonight from here, and we feel well able and prepared to do that. We don't have to resort to any attack on him physically because our argument has already beat him up all night long. So I just want you to know that. And may God bless him and you, because we believe that one day he'll make a good one. I, I, want to, I want to make a suggestion to those who are standing online. Those of you who have questions, you know, I'm going to ask you to, you know, to just make them. If you have speeches to make, we ask you to be fair enough and step on the side, okay? Because we have a serious time problem and we just want to get to the questions. My sister. Peace and blessings. Um, and I just want to pay homage to the last sister who spoke because I think it is truly representative of what happens when the female principal is allowed to be reborn inside of our organizations. Now, I want to deal with 
a situation in terms of organizations and the Messiah complex. We as African people do have to, uh, we do have to be able to analyze and criticize and understand that people are men, women, human beings, and not gods. And I think we're here in the spirit of truth and harmony to try and find out what happened so that we can heal from the situation. I too am part of a theocratic organization where there is a head and the, it, it's the Osar said society. There are people inside of that society who do not criticize the leader, who cannot see weaknesses and you're almost condemned if you say anything. I think this is a dangerous precedent. We, and I think it comes, whether, whether we go into Islam, a traditional African-based revolutionary organizations, I've seen the same mindset. I've seen the same mindset and I call it the Messiah complex because all of us through slavery, through this brand of Christianity that we have, through slavery, have been taught to look for a Messiah. And we don't want our Messiah to be able to do anything wrong. My question, my question is, why did the sisters leave? Did I miss something? Did I miss a snap of a finger, a nod of a head, or something that made the sisters leave? And I think that it does not look good for the nation of Islam. I also have another point to bring in terms of the sisters. And I think that we have to deal with our personal lives in terms of these organizations. Yes. Is, it, is it, are you really a truly a political brother if you can take advantage of sisters, exploit sisters, and then turn around and call yourself political? Are you Conrad Muhammad? Do, can you have more than one wife? Whether you and wives are people who are known publicly. Wives are not somebody that you have only in the bedroom. Okay, so I'm saying, are you allowed to have more than one wife in the Nation of Islam? The organization that I'm with, the, the Asar Set Society, the king has five wives, and members of the society can get into a polygamous relationship if they go through proper procedures and channels. This is structure. So I, we have to deal with the situation of men and women inside of our organization. Thank you, Sister. First, I have a question. Our captain, regional captain, Dennis Muhammad, the captain of the Fruit of Islam in New York, has been reminding me all night to make it public to you why the sisters left. We don't want you, brother, to think it was a disrespect of what you were saying. But when the brothers stood up in the office, the captain made a decision that the sisters from the MGPT be dismissed. And that is something that was made from a security point of view. And so, whether you agree with it or not, that's why it was done. We'll make sure that they get the tape. And it really was no insult to you. Okay? Now for the last question. Well, sister, you can leave if you want. We asked our sisters to leave. But if you want to stay, then you have the right to stay. Sister, it's a free. Well, sister, sister, you know that in the nation we are in an organization we submit to a discipline. This is not new. You know this about the nation. If you don't agree with it, that's one thing. But at least you know where we are. And when the captain of the FOI, which is the head of all security, makes the decision, as Muslims we hear and obey. So that is our organizational policy. Maybe yours does not have that. So just understand, we understand yours, please try and understand ours, even if you disagree. Now the last question the sister asked, uh, no, I, I don't have more than one wife, sister. I am not financially, intellectually, spiritually, morally, 
probably physically qualified to have more than one wife. But, no, I am not allowed. No, I am not allowed. Uh, based on the fact that I don't measure up. Now, you know in our religion that is acceptable. But, since the black man has been so destroyed, it's, it'll, be a, it'll be a while before we mature on those levels to be able to handle more than one wife. But with all of our women out here, with no husbands, with our women, with no guide, with no man struggling, with all of our babies that some foolish brother made and walked away from, we have to begin to assess polygamy as an alternative to that reality. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, as our leader, was to lead us first by example into that lifestyle. And we're still trying to catch up to him. So I thank you for that question. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me, I would just like to say something. Most of you who are there on the line, and I appreciate that you are there, supposedly to ask questions, but most of you are making speeches. We're losing our audience as a result. So please, those of you who have questions, would you come forward and ask your question? Those who want to make comments, would you fall to the rear of the line so that we can address, you can address questions to the panel so we can draw out their thinking and hear what they have to say. Respectfully, I ask you, please don't kill any more of our time with comments and speeches. We want questions addressed to the audience, uh, to the uh, panel here. Some of them will have to leave very shortly. I'd appreciate it if you would do that. I just want to add, well, uh, Bill Sales wants to respond to something, but also before, someone whom we wanted to uh, address the, the audience earlier is here. Um, Brother Sonny Carson has a co comment that he would like to make. I just want to invite him, Sonny. Give us mic here. Uh, peace. About 31 years ago, I was standing in front of a downstate hospital and I looked up the street and the crackers with cameras were running down the street following a brother who I recognized immediately as Malcolm. And he only had one brother with him. As he got to where I was standing, he stopped to address the uh, press, and the brother that was with him said to him, maybe we better not do this, and Malcolm looked around at me and says, I'm not worried, this brother will have, has my back. A few months later, when I heard that Malcolm was killed, I knew instantly who killed him. It was the crackers. I don't care who pulled the trigger, I knew. And I committed my life then to the liberation of my people. I think it's, 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 it's a conflict for me to stand amongst our people and hear them using the crackers language they imposed on us to attack each other. And, you know, it's, it's ridiculous and it has, to, it has to stop. We come too far. We are a great and mighty people. We cannot let hostility destroy us. We are bigger than that. I, I only came forward uh, 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 to, 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 to express that, to get that out of my system, but the most important thing I came forward to do was to thank Herman and the people in the committee to doing this, because I, I, I had no intentions of coming here. I had no intentions, because I'm, I'm not, Crazy. Immersed with crazy about rhetoric and all that. I, 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 I'm uh, more than that, I think. But my point, though, is that I want to commend the committee and Herman and make you aware of something that he told me today, that he decided, they decided to have this forum today because they didn't want to have conflict with Dr. Shabazz and, and the group of Negroes that are going to have their thing on the day, the actual day that Malcolm was assassinated. And I 
when I heard about it, I was really opposed to it, but I want to thank him for, and, and commend him for doing that. But I think, though, that we all owe ourselves one thing, and that's that we have to do something on the 21st, you see. This is the 30th anniversary of the brother's uh, death. And so we're calling on everybody to come out on, on Tuesday at 5 o'clock to the, at, at the Autobahn Ballroom for one hour to pay respects to that a moment. And then at 7 uh, p.m., come on to Brooklyn to the El Haj Malik Shabazz Elementary School where we're inviting all of you to come and continue this, but only in the spirit of unity. Peace. I was concerned a few minutes ago when the sister said she had come tonight and hadn't gotten the most fundamental question that brought us all here answered. I thought there were answers put out to that question. But what she said, I was very much concerned. Because if nothing else, we have to understand that Malcolm followed and Kuma's dictum, seek ye first the political kingdom, and all else will be added unto you. That is why he was assassinated. He was assassinated because he advocated that African Americans turn to pan-African internationalism and fundamentally define their struggle as a struggle for human rights. In that struggle, the enemy was defined as the imperialists organized, this is Malcolm's word, in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, that that struggle had to use any and all means, moral suasion, political action, nonviolence, and revolutionary violence. Malcolm X believed that revolution was possible in America. Malcolm also believed that a united front had to be formed, but it had to be formed on the basis of principled unity. Not everybody's agenda in the black community could be the number one agenda in the united front. It had to be the agenda of the most dispossessed segments of our community. Any other unity would be unprincipled. Now why should we reiterate this? Look, there are all kinds of goals and objectives that one can seek in life. Martin Delaney, the father of African American nationalism, said if you seek a spiritual goal, pray. If you seek a moral goal, live an upright life. But if you seek a physical, if you seek a political goal, then you've got to get together with your muscles, your sweat, your tears, your struggle, and your sacrifice. You have to build a secular political movement based on principles, and you've got to get down and fight the enemy. Right. Malcolm raised this very clearly for us, so clearly that every abysmal idiot in our community could understand that. And that's why he is in the ground at the age of 39. That's why he was killed, not just to kill his body, but to kill that message, to make us forget that message, to make us stop organizing, to make us stop believing that revolution is possible in this country and that someday the African people here are going to be liberated. That's why he's dead. That's what I came here to tell you, and I hope you've heard me whether you get me or not. We're going to do this for another 20 minutes, and then we have to wrap it up. My brother, quickly, please, your questions. If you don't have a question, we're going to have to ask you to leave the mic, okay? Well, I don't have a question, and I wish to make well, it. Well, save the statement until later, please, as the brother asked you. Save the statement yeah, until after. I have a question. I have a question. You have a question? Okay. Why is it why is it that we're so pressed for time? And our pressure has all the time. Brother, brother, we have, question. Well, let me let me have, we have a limited time in here. Well, which you're wasting right now. I'm asking Secondly, you. we have we invited a number of people here as speakers. Not everybody in the auditorium can come up and give a speech. Any one of you. It's not ask a speech. Ask a question. But I ask you if you have a question, ask it. You, you said you it? didn't have a question. Did you hear it? Why is it that, that we are so pressed for time? Because they you know, yet they the press has all the time in the world to oppress us. Brother, we have a contract. We have a contract that says we have to be out of here at a certain time. Give me a second to finish. Joe, why don't you stand on the side of the road? Yeah, I'm all right. Good. Good. Come close here. There's a very strange dichotomy here this evening, and my question is to the professor or anybody else. Language is all we have, and language can always, always be misunderstood and be deceitful. For my own edification, 
Is there black leadership in the United States of America? And if so, is it bankrupt? If it's not, where is it? Yes, sir. Question of black leadership. Is there black leadership in the African American community? If it is, is it bankrupt or what? That's a, that's a mean question. Yeah, I think that there is. I think that there is African leadership. I think that the challenge that we run into is that too often we're looking, and I think it actually goes back to what my sister was saying. I think too often we look for that Messiah, you know, that one, the ultimate leader. I think historically we have never had that ultimate leader. What we've had is lots of different leaders dealing with different perspectives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think that what I challenge as a people, though, and I think this is what my brother was alluding to earlier, and I think other panelists have said, and I think some of the audience, is the extent to which we're able to, you know, work together despite the different distance, you know, despite the different, despite the different differences that we as a people have. I think that has been our challenges over the years, and I think that's really what we're struggling with right now. The other point that I would also say, too, is that I think that for any people, and not just African people, but I think for any people, you should always expect conflict, you should always expect differences. The major challenge, the major challenge that we have is that if we can just develop an agenda that most of us will agree to, because we ain't never gonna have an agenda that all of us are gonna agree to, but if we can develop an agenda where most people in organizations, where most leaders, where most African people, where the masses of the people were pretty much adhered to, then I think we have a chance to at least forge, you know, more of a of a, a unified front. But this one Messiah coming along and then everybody is supposed to follow that one Messiah and stuff, I think that's mythical at best. You don't want a leader. Uh, this is directed to Mr. Kondo and Mr. Uh, Mahama. Uh, Mr. Kondo, I read your book and I learned a little bit about uh, Captain Joseph. And I saw a few films and uh, he said that the nation had nothing to do with the bombing of Malcolm's house, right? And I recently saw uh, Brother Minister Malcolm. And at the end of the film, uh, it was in print. It says before he died, he admitted that the nation bombed the house. And my question, uh, to you, Mr. Mohammed, if that's true, because I'm asking if it's true, uh, did he act under the orders of Mr. Elijah, or could he just do that on his own? If it's true. Well, again, I was not there, but I can only say what the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has said. He said that many of the Muslims would have killed Malcolm. He said he himself felt like killing them. But they were instructed by the messenger to leave Malcolm alone. The house legally belonged to the nation. I knew Captain Yusuf Shaw. He taught me a few things before Allah took him. He never said to me that he had anything to do with the bombing. And I would like to know who he said it to. It's easy for a white man making a movie to put a trailer on a movie that before he died, a man that's dead admitted something that no one that I know who knew Captain Yusuf Shah, the great captain, ever heard him say that I know. Okay, thank you. I don't have a question, but I sit on that line. So I don't have a question, but... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, sister. Can I address the question? Um, Yusef Shaw actually said the same thing to, to Spike uh, when he was you know, working on a film. And in fact, Spike has it uh, on tape. Um, and I'm, I don't, you know, it's, it's probably accessible. Uh, for those of you who might be who might be interested in that, um, which I don't, I mean, I don't know if that should be you know real surprising to anybody though. But I, you know, it, he said it, the point I'm making is that he said it to someone else as well. 
I want to say the first gentleman, Come closer, the first gentleman who came up and spoke about the Nation of Islam of yesterday and about Elijah Muhammad, he would agree with the Nation of Islam today. I don't see anybody else trying to uplift the black community but the Nation of Islam. And I have a four-year-old son. For 14 years, he would be a black man in America. And if the Nation of Islam is working today to make a better world for him tomorrow, then we all should be with the Nation of Islam because they can't do it by themselves. I don't see them trying to help the black community when it's convenient or when it can sell. I see them trying to help them every day. And we should all be, we can't have peace without unity. <laughs> Good evening, and I feel the spirit of balance now. However, my question is, I belong to a group progressively in Philadelphia, and we'd like to know when can we get with members of, some members of the nation of Islam to get together on political prisoners and prisoners of war. Former mayor at the Jabal. Okay, thank you. You should contact Brother Minister Rodney Muhammad in Philadelphia. He is located at 2506 North Broad Street at Muhammad Mosque number 12. And, and that's your content per se. My question is uh, to everyone in here, and not uh, excluding basically really the um, Nation of Islam, because I know they're doing some work in, in Harlem, Harlem, I mean Harlem, to change the whole situation. My question to everyone in here and anyone else on the panel, what are we doing to uplift this area and, and black folks? Oh, you said excluding the nation of Islam? I know they're going to ask? Yes. Is it a theoretical question or? Well, theoretical. No, he knows what he's saying. Well, I mean, Brother doesn't live in Harlem. He works in, in Maryland. I'm, just, I'm being very, very, I'm trying to assess your question. Um, you want to respond to this question? Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Take the Let's, let's, you know, let's take the, the next question. You, you don't want the nation to respond to it. Is it my right to uh, uh, ask a question now? I'm suspicious that all of us who are sitting here talking about Malcolm, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and all, have we learned our lessons so well Number one, why don't we know we are Africans? And two, why would we be wasting all this time and energy when we know we as men are supposed to answer the question for the liberation of our nation yes. and stop with this, all this other stuff. Who killed Malcolm? Malcolm is dead, everybody's dead. We are not. When are we going to answer the question as men instead of as academia? think anyone can answer when are we gonna ask that I mean, like men everybody up here acts like men you know we're convinced of that um, my brother next question yes. yes my question is directed to the nation of Islam um, with the with the respects uh, of what the, yes with the respect of what the nation of Islam has, has been doing for the past 30 years uh, my question is will there be a time as as the nation of Islam being the best qualified to train our black women and black men when they will set up subordinating institutions under the, under the banner and fundamental principles of Islam without converting Africans who are by birthright naturally the children of God um, us to a religion which started in 527 AD by Muhammad which was not a religion and bef uh, before that I'm not, I'm not attacking the nation of Islam, I'm just bringing this as a concept, maybe in the 21st century, going into the 21st century with the war against us black men here. Will there be a, a, a time when we could come together? Maybe our, 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 our religion might be slightly different, but if it's under the same fundamental pr principles that is not disrespecting the nation of Islam, uh, can we start training uh, young black Africans? I, I thank you, brother, for that question. And this is a wonderful place to end tonight's meeting. 
brothers and sisters, I want to say before I leave, I love the Honorable Minister Lewis Park. I know what he means to me, what he has meant to me, what he did for me in my life. So when I hear him attack, that's like somebody attacking your father. I was in great pain one night when I heard Brother Zach Kondo on the radio say he couldn't absolve the Nation of Islam of the murder of Malcolm. He couldn't absolve the Honorable Elijah Muhammad of that murder. Well, when you attack that nation, and it makes those of us who see value in it naturally want to defend it. But we want to defend it seeking truth based on truth. So tonight was an exercise in that. But I want you to know that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan loves every one of you. And he's making me to love every one of you, even though we sometimes agree. Brother Lambe, we sometimes disagree, but I have great respect for him. Brother Sonny Carson. Viola. We don't always agree, but I see them as those working for black people. But what I don't see sometimes is the respect of those who are not religious people for our work. Here a man takes black men, teaches them to love self, to know self, to unite with self, to do for self, to get off drugs, we will open this week a $4.4 million restaurant, not in white folks downtown, but in the ghetto, the south side of Chicago, 79th Street. It wasn't built by a loan from white people. It was grassroots people putting their nickels, dimes, dollars, and quarters together so that when we have events, we like we don't have to come to the white man's schools. We'll have our own place. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us to love ourselves. And not only that, but he showed us that we could do something for self. We just bought a thousand, 1,600 acre farm in Georgia. That's to feed you. We at one time were the largest importers of fish in the country, bringing in a million pounds of fish to help you eat better. But sometimes I don't think that our brothers and sisters who are Marxists, who are Leninists, who are intellectuals, respect properly the contribution of the nation. You should not condemn Farrakhan. You should be happy that in an era when black people were not engaged in struggle in great numbers, he loved the Honorable Elijah Muhammad enough and loved the work of the nation to rebuild the nation, whether you say, Brother Wally, he was the heir apparent or not, he got a fool like me. And had he not raised up the nation, I probably would have been out in the street smoking dope, slinging drugs, or working for the white man to oppress black people. So whatever he's done, please, brother, let me finish. Whatever he's done in the way of lifting up a black group that was destroyed, you should be happy. You should support that, brothers and sisters. Brother Wally, please. You're my elder, and I respect you. I'm only concluding the point. Yes, sir. Well, brothers, well, brothers and sisters. You don't know Malcolm. You don't know Minister Farrakhan. I know both. They're both of my ministers. My brother, don't say I don't know my leader and teacher. You should not have to recognize him. Yes, sir. No, he should not have to recognize him. I'm sorry, brother. No, excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. The man directed it directly to me, and he's wrong. Brother Wally, excuse me, please. No, no. Yes, sir. See, I'm not going to let you play off on me and lift up Mr. Farrakhan on me. 
I'm not let you do that. I'm not going to permit that. I repeat, I repeat. No, he didn't say anything to that brother the way he said it to me. No, he also named Pray the tape back. Pray the tape back. He did not direct to him, but he directed towards me. Now, I'm not stupid now. Elijah Muhammad taught me also. All right? And he taught me well. All right? He directed it towards me, and it was wrong. Point was made. Point was made. He's apologized, brother. I don't need no apologies, brother. Because she she she's gonna use me to let Minister Farrakhan out. But I just wanted to. And all that love between Minister Farrakhan and Elijah Muhammad, I, I could dispel that. I don't want to do that. You don't know. Well, let me just say, brothers and sisters. Yeah, but don't direct me. I don't want to live. I don't want to play off on anyone to lift up the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. He has 40 years of service in the black community, and if that is not lifting him up enough then there's nothing I can say tonight because many of you knew him before I did. And no matter what you can say about him, you cannot say he's not meant a great deal to practically everyone in this room. Everybody's been touched by something he said and everyone has been made to love themselves a little bit more based upon his words and teachings for the last 40 years. So may Allah bless you. Whatever you feel toward him, you have a right to but recognize that he is my leader and teacher and spiritual father. And I thank Allah, all, almighty God, Allah, over and over again for what he has meant in my life. So I thank you for listening tonight. Brothers, the last thing I want to say in response to your question is that I don't know of one man that has worked harder to bridge the gap and bring unity amongst black people. He's gone in the churches. He's gone in the synagogues, black synagogues. He's gone into the nationalist groups. And he has sought to make us a more unified people than ever before. He's calling on a million man's march. Why do you think they raised the Kabila Shabazz incident? Why do you think they're raising this issue again? Because they want to dilute the strength of that march. But Zach Kondo should be at that march. Sonny Carson should be at that march. We all should be there. You should be there. Because the good that will come from that march will benefit us all. Last thing. Last year he spoke to 150,000 men around the country. And he formed manhood training. We have that going on in New York today. This is an opportunity for all brothers and sisters, regardless to religion, regardless to philosophy or ideology, to work together for the embedment of our people. And the final thing that you said, brother, that I have to correct, and especially for this group in particular, you make a mistake when you say that Islam was something we had to be converted to. I'm sorry, but Islam has no said birth record. Islam means submission to the will of God. And that's what we do, that's what Malcolm strove to do, and that's what right-thinking black people in Islam do. If you go to the East right now, they're complaining and attacking Farrakhan because he's too black, because he refused to bow down to the racist cultural imperials who are, in fact, Arabs and want to use their race to make us bow down to their way of devotion. We have a way that is unique for the black man and woman of America. And that's why a lot of the, our brothers and sisters in religious orthodoxy don't agree with us, don't like us, because we refuse to be other than what we are. We are black men and women. We are lost, found members of the broader nation of Islam. And we make no apologies for that. We recognize a black man as our leader. We do not believe that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is dead. The Holy Quran says, speak not against those of those who are slain or die in the way of Allah as dead. For they're not dead, but you perceive not. Is Jesus dead? You've got Christians all over the earth 
waiting on Jesus to come back. I thought this was the last one, but I just want to make a final point. And that is the last thing, sister, and I'll stay afterwards if you'd like. But I got to say this. This is very important. Because even if you think the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is dead, he said, I'll be the winner, living or dead. And you can't say that we're following a dead leader because we got a living leader right now that we're about to go see in Chicago. And he is the Honorable Louis Farrakhan sitting in the seat of the Messenger of Allah, the most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But we expect that he will come back to the black man and woman. So that's where we are. May Allah bless you. As-salamu alaykum. Thank you. Let me, let me just say, um, the minister appears to be leaving. I didn't know that he no, was leaving. No, he said he quit. Oh, I thought you were leaving. Okay. I just want to say, uh, give a, a friendly uh, piece of advice to you, my brother, that you try not to make so many assumptions about people. Uh, like what our beliefs are, because we oppose or have a different point of view to yours as to make us Leninists or whatever other labels you've chosen to saddle us with. Uh, you ain't correct. You know, investigate first. Secondly, no one attacked the Honorable Minister Farrakhan this evening. Nor, nor have I seen anywhere in Zach Condo's book any attack on attack Minister Farrakhan. But yet, I don't know, it's sort of, maybe it's a defensive thing, I don't know, but it's, it seems to be, uh, it's been referred to about 10 times that there are people here who are attacking Minister Farrakhan. I don't know where this happens. I just want to put it on the tape so that it's clear that no one is doing that and no one is that what you are suggesting that we might be, my sister. I'd like to ask of Brother Sales, if I can com complete all the way through first. I'd like to ask of Brother Sales, your reflection on the psychological imposition being placed upon young Africans in terms of the jailhouse mentality being sold so freely, seduced or interlaid within the popular culture. Of the brother, your oversight or your observation for us, please, and where you see our young people who are on, on the university circuit, their relationship to community work and their aggression with regards to young people within the community. Is that, is my question? I'd like to ask Brother Khalid Muhammad his observation, his observation of this evening and if there is any information he would like to share with this body of Africans. I'd like to ask our brother from the mosque, is there any information you would be able to share with me? I am, my area is that of media. For the reflection, the criticism that have been given within the mosque for the delivery of information, away, moving it away from dogma, moving it away from intimidation, and having it more interactive or more communicative for people who are within and outside of the mosque. Because my understanding is that by the mandate of Islam, that we are all Muslims. Jesus. To your question uh, about <clears throat> Malcolm's relevance to the I guess the, the gangster mentality, psychological conditioning of African uh, of men in this country, I think what's so important about Malcolm is that he represents a role model of transformation given the image that's been imposed on our young black men and women. And that it's not so much that Malcolm you know, legitimizes the notion that one can be in jail, that we're all in prison. But what's all important is so important also is that he transcends the penitentiary. He transcends that model of manhood force. Now one thing that's of concern to me is that a certain way that he transcends it. And this is what's not being really delivered to our, to our youth. The anger part, the need to argue and fight back in a sense is, but there's certain other things. And some of these came out tonight. All right? 
Malcolm respected the intellectual endeavor as an integral part of liberation. Right? Malcolm would not come in a place like here tonight and talk about, well, you academics don't know what's going on or what have you. Malcolm respected the power of the word. He respected the, st the power of study, analysis, and action. This is some aspect of Malcolm that has not yet penetrated our youth the way that it should. Secondly, Malcolm said you have to go beyond anger, you have to unite, and you have to fight back. That there's a concrete enemy out there that we have to mobilize to attack. All right? That's the second you know, thing that we need to bring to our youth that they don't have this part of psychological emancipation. And the third thing that the process of fighting back is not merely in the domestic arena, but it requires an international perspective that we reach out and that we form links across waters, across continents, all right? and that we fight back. This is the relevance of Malcolm to the young. Then one last point, and, and I'll step back. There's been a whole lot of talk about black males as an endangered species, and this blows my mind. I walk around Harlem, right? Most of the crackheads I see are black women, right? If I go up to Harlem Hospital, most of the people who are dying of AIDS, most of the young people are young black women. If I walk through the streets, most of the people being brutalized, most of the people being brutalized are young black women, all right? And one very important thing about Malcolm, and one of the most controversial things, right, even outside the organization of Afro-American Union, Muslim Mosque Incorporated, Malcolm came back from Africa and said, there's got to be a new role for women. They have to be given an equal role in the organization of Afro-American Union. A whole lot of brothers said, well, it's time for us to leave. Malcolm has lost his mind. He put a sister in day-to-day -day charge in the organization of Afro-American Union. Her name was Lynn Shiflin. And I won't name any brothers today. They had a great difficulty with that. All right? And so it seems to me when we talk about black males and their psychological emancipation, we have to continuously emphasize that there ain't no black male liberation without black female liberation. I just, I will try to address your, your uh, question as far as the educational system and, and, uh, and African peoples as quickly as possible. First book that I wrote, The Black Student's Guide to Positive Education, I actually dealt with this issue. One of the points that I think that we need to consistently realize is that the educational system of this country, uh, A, is not designed for us, B, is really designed to control our minds. Carter G. Woodson said it best, Miseducation of the Negro, 1933. If you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not need to tell him not to stand here or go yonder. He will find his proper place and stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he will cut one for his, best, for his special benefit." Unquote. The problem that we run into as African peoples is that sometimes we think that education is objective. Sometimes we think that education is unbiased. Sometimes we think that education is you know, it's just. The truth of the matter is, is that education is one of the most powerful weapons that the enemy uses against us. The other thing is that the education by its design is designed to teach us to hate ourselves, to despise ourselves, to believe in white supremacy, to believe in black inferiority, to be capitalists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Final point is that until we begin as a people to realize that we really don't have much choice in the matter. Either we totally transform the system, you know, which I guess we're attempting to do that through, you know, changing the curriculums and all of that, which, you know, is kind of problematic if you really get down to it and stuff. Or we must develop educational systems ourselves. Now, one of the good things is that historically we've always had organizations, we've always had, you know, different institutions that were, you know, designed in order to, um, you know, to educate our children. That is vital for our empowerment and liberation. Our challenge is that we need lots of them and we need them north, south, east, and west. We need them in Harlem, we need them in Maryland, we need them in DC, we need them all over the place, A and in B. We also need them to be teaching our children, teaching our students that they have responsibilities to our people and that it's their responsibility to be warriors. Because one final point is that if we do not understand that if we do not use education in order to empower us to fight for our people, then basically the educational system, if we don't do nothing with that, will basically teach us to fight against our people. Uh, 
Um, a colleague Mohammed does decline to respond to your question, so uh, we'll just move on to. Uh, um, as I said at the outset, he, you know, said he wouldn't be he'd be on the rostrum, but wouldn't be speaking this evening. Robert, uh, my question is about today. Aside from the painful process of healing and uh, reuniting, or perhaps uniting as a family, I'd like to know. Uh, Anyone in a position to know, Brother Khalid, Minister Conrad, uh, Brother Zach, Brother Bill, whoever, what information do we have today about what is being done to our people outside of the family? Specifically, what governmental intelligence interference patterns and activities are taking place today as they did 30 years ago? What new information do you have and how do we act against it? Before uh, the answer, the tapes from today's program are now available, so you can pick them up on your way out in the back of the room, and they're still serving dinners. That's good. Just very briefly, in this latest incident with the Real Shabazz, here you have a government agent. I don't know technically. Brother Zach. But to me, when you hobnob and get in the bed with the government, various law enforcement or intelligence agencies of the state, you are an agent. This man, Fitzpatrick. See, that's why we don't need to spend a lot of time about the nation and their hatred of Malcolm, because the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, even though he was the target of the assassination attempt, he said, Let's put our hands around the Shabazz family. Let's support the bill. Let's raise money if we have to. Let's do whatever we have to do to support this family. But it's not the nation that has waged this war on the Shabazz family. You go back to the state of Michigan because they killed Malcolm's father and permitted it to be covered up. Then that same white man stayed put his mother in a mental institution. Then that same white man killed Malcolm. Then that same white man today took Malcolm's grandson, who is named Malcolm, from his daughter and put him, the same state now, took him from his mother and then sent a low down filthy character whom she thought was her friend whom, from what we understand, proposed to marry her. Brought her out to Minnesota. And then this devil turned her in to his bosses. See, this is the deep-seated evil of the Caucasian. And I guarantee you, even though we fight and kill each other, when you go to the root of it, you'll find him. But that's what the government is doing today from our perspective. In addition to other things. What other things are they, what other things? Has this case got, gotten new information or new leads into the nation? New leads? I mean, on the part of government surveillance, intelligence, and uh, that's okay. Yeah, I'd like, to also, I'd like to also address that issue. Um, some of you are for me. Actually, the enemy is doing lots of things right now. And they're getting a hell of a lot more electronic and a hell of a lot more mechanical these days. In the past, they had to go into people's homes in order to plant bugs, in order to wire, you know, for surveillance and stuff. Nowadays, they can do it through television. They got various uh, satellites up there now that they can now cue in on conversations like what's happening right now, with us right now. They're also getting real well, you know, they're not getting it. You know, the enemy's always been like this. But lately, they've gotten into revising some of that whole genetic bullshit that Hitler's organization was about with these, with the so-called violence initiative that some of you are no doubt familiar with. You know they have now, Congress is now going to be funding the violence initiative. For those of you who are unfamiliar, yeah, for those of you who are unfamiliar with that, these Europeans have come up with an extraordinary ideal and this idea is, is that they feel that if they can place markers on young African males at about the age of maybe four or five, 
and put them on different drugs that are designed to basically play with our heads and stuff consistently that it would prevent young African males from growing up violent and eventually, and this is part of the dictum, and eventually would prevent them from perhaps even killing a president of the United States or something like that. What is ridiculous is that in 1992 the initiative was denied funding because you know people, people got wind of it, they started talking about it, and then they realized that this was ridiculous so they put it off. But in 1995, they have now decided to refund it. Now, I don't think any of us need to be rocket scientists to figure out that if anything like this even goes a little ways and stuff, I mean, this is like the ultimate example, the ultimate example of chemical warfare. It doesn't get any worse than this. Now, final point is that if nothing else, I think that should give us an ideal of where the enemy is right now with regard you know, to us. We're going to have to wrap this soon. Uh, Brother Her <coughs> Herman Ferguson has a question. Just give me a second, please. Uh, so point you wants to raise. <clears throat> yes, I'd like to uh, apologize for this because, uh, but I think it's an important question. We have a brother here who was an invited, special invited guest who just declined to speak. But I think that there is an important question I want to ask, and I believe that he would answer it. You know that Brother Khalid had an attack on his life recently. And I'd like to know, uh, in the context of what we're trying to do here, does that have any significance or relevancy to this whole forum and what we're trying to talk about? Brother Khalid, would you address that question? In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. Bear witness that there is but one God came in the person here to the hells of North America in the person of Master Farad Muhammad to whom praise is due forever. We forever thank him for raising up his messenger and his Messiah, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we thank the two of them for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I greet you, my brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Upon being invited, of course, in my absence from the city, and speaking to one who spoke to those who extended the invitation, I said that I would not speak here tonight because I did not feel it appropriate and that is still my feeling for if you'll be patient you'll get the why <laughs> buckle your seatbelt it has been now one year since my suspension from national spokesman, Minister Malcolm was the first great national spokesman of the Nation of Islam. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan was the second and chose me to be the third in that line. It has been a year since my suspension from national assistant, spokesman or representative and from the ministry. And during that year, now over a year, has become an indefinite suspension, I have made attempts to reach my spiritual father, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and I have not really been able to set up a meeting successfully with him. Certainly there, why don't you be quiet for a minute, let me answer the questions. As difficult as it was, and I didn't mean any disrespect, but I was answering your disrespect. As difficult as it is to even stand up here, don't prompt me. Don't push me. You push me to say something that maybe I shouldn't say or wouldn't have said, as Malcolm was probably prompted and pushed too much 30 years ago. 
This has happened almost 30 years to the day in many ways. I didn't set it that way and I didn't plan it that way. It started in November 30 years ago. It started again in November 30 years later at King College. Many other parallels that are not necessary to go into now, but one in particular. Malcolm, it is true, made attempts to reach the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. We don't know if his calls were being intercepted. We don't know if his mail was being intercepted. We don't know what government operatives worked between Malcolm and his spiritual father. I have, for the most part, not spoken on this subject because I am still waiting for my meeting with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And until I have that meeting with him, there are things that I would like to hear from him. And there are things, as a son would say, that I would like to say to him. And I don't think I should say them to you before I say them to him. And some of you, might not agree with that. I believe I understand Brother Malcolm more today than I have ever understood him before. I was not in the Nation of Islam 30 years ago. I was in my mid-teens at that time down in Houston, Texas and had not yet moved on to the university where I would meet the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan as a young student leader there in New Orleans. So there are many things on my heart, but I think if you will permit me to be just a little wise today, it would be better, and I'm sure if you will weigh it, you would agree with me. I don't know how long it will take, it's been over a year. But during that year, I have not said as little as a word, nor as much as a sentence against my spiritual father, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And no matter what I have on my heart, again, I think it should be said between father and son behind closed doors and some resolution made behind closed doors before I come back to the broader community and the broader family. I have many questions to ask. Keene College was not a speech where I stood up to condemn my teacher. Keene College was not a speech where I was going into his domestic life. King College was a speech, as all of my speeches, where I was given the white man hell, and I will continue to do that, and I make no apology for that. And so I'm still tender about that subject. Jews, so-called Jews, outside of that auditorium calling for his death, I was in a war spirit and a war posture. And I felt that I did what was right. Felt that I should have even done more. It should have gone beyond the rostrum and should have been taken outside as we did in Los Angeles when we drove them away from the convention center and drove them running down the streets. I wonder what would have been done then. So for the president to come out, Bill, Willie, Slick Willie, the vice president, the United States Senate to vote unanimously against me. For the first time, the House of Representatives and the full Congress and all of the mayors and governors and city councils and state assemblies and Negro organizations and Negro preachers, Ben Chavis, Reverend Behind, Reverend Butts, <laughs> some of the other Negroes who came out against me, Jesse Lewis Jackson, 
who called the white folks. They didn't have to call him. He called them. Ben Chavis bragged in this city on TV how he was the first to call Minister Farrakhan to say something needed to be done about Khaled. All of that and my last word. What's on my heart, I'll have to hold. As the old folks say, I'm just going to tarry a while. And I'm going to wait until my change comes. I don't believe that no matter how long it takes, I will continue the liberation struggle for our people. But no matter how long it takes, I don't believe you will be finding Colin coming out against Louis Farrakhan. Whatever happened 30 years ago between the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan, today, Malcolm with the honorable Elijah Muhammad 30 years ago and Minister Farrakhan with Khaled today, hopefully, prayerfully, Farrakhan and Khaled can put a positive period behind the history of Elijah and Malcolm. Thank you. Brothers, the hour is late. We're going to have to cut the questions. We want to thank Brother Khaled Muhammad, and I also want to, at this point, I'm, I'm sorry. We just, you know, we just have to cut the questions right here. I want to invite the speaker to the, the washroom, Sister Joan Gibbs, who's with the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee, and with the Medgar Scarlet Center for Law and Justice. Sister Joan Gibbs. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to be brief because I do know how to be brief. And I want to thank all of you on behalf of the committee for coming out tonight and re-invite you to join us in May because as this marks the 30th anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm, this also marks the 70th anniversary of his birth. And in that spirit in May, we will have a week-long series of events and I also want to point out to you, because the question has been raised repeatedly about how events like this is divisive, when the Malcolm X Committee worked not only to preserve Malcolm's legacy, we don't do it as an abstraction, but we do it because we think that Malcolm's teachings are important to the rebuilding and Yes, the rebuilding of the black liberation movement, and that's why principally we work to teach him out. We don't do it, we work to preserve his legacy. We don't do it because he's an icon or he's a god or anything like that. But we think that the brother taught us some things that are vital to our movement today. The second thing, we, in examining the assassination, people have talked tonight about the role of the U.S. government. And we think that's important for our people to understand the U.S. government and understand our relationship to that government. And that our people have been at war with that government ever since we got here. And we need to continue that war until we win it and liberate ourselves as the people. But we can only do that if we understand the nature of the beast that we're fighting. And you know, it was said earlier tonight, and I think we need to remember that the FBI chief among all of the agencies of the United States government, only exceeded by the CIA, is one of our principal enemies. And we need to keep them out of our mess. Finally, I want to say, because I think it's also important, this, these events are just not to get you out to listen, but we want to urge you to do something. And what I always try to urge people to do is really get behind the struggle for political prisoners. I talked this morning to a, one of the longest held political prisoners in the United States, my brother Sandiana Akoli, and he asked me to encourage you to do that. Also, the right to him and the other political prisoners, Sandiana was recently given another 20 years, denied parole, and he needs our support because we know the brother is there in part because they don't have the sister asylum, and we need to help to get Sunday out out. Thank you, get home safely, and please pick up the literature about Mamiya in the back, and pick up some information, sign the petitions for Mamiya, and join us in May. Thank you.